Hi, we're going to call this work session of the Board of Education to order um, and rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just as we're uh, starting, um, Miss Doe is on her way. She was attending a top-notch Shakespeare performance at Parkway School today. I saw one at uh, Julian Curtis this afternoon. Uh, and for those high school teachers, tomorrow in the Black Box Theater, all of the schools are doing uh, their Shakespeare plays. So if you get a chance to sneak in and see your future students, that would probably be fantastic. All right, with that, um, can we get a motion to approve the meeting agenda? Ms. Dayton, is there a second? Dr. Francis. So um, I'm going to make a motion to add a superintendent report to the meeting, a brief superintendent report uh, as the first discussion item. Is there a second? Dr. Francis, any discussion on that? All those in favor? All right. So, uh, Ms. O'Neill, I think you had another yes, motion. I'd like to move the communications report up for a discussion. So we'll make that the, uh, the last discussion item if we can, because I know Ms. Hughes will be with us to the end. <laughs> all right, so is there a second for that motion? Ms. Tayton, all those in favor? All right, 7-0, thank you. All right, so we've, uh, just for Michael's purposes, so the first motion was to add a brief superintendent report. It's the first discussion item. The second was to move a written report, uh, the, the, the face written report. <coughs> So, all of, is there any discussion on the agenda otherwise? So, all those in favor of the amended agenda? Yes. All right, 7 0, oh, 6 0, sorry, thank you very much. All right, so with that, the first discussion item is a brief superintendent report. Thank you. you. Well, first, please permit me to thank you all for the incredible opportunity to learn and lead within Greenwich Public School District this year. It's been amazing. Even in the short time I've been here, I've come to value and care for so very many of you, staff, families, students, community members, and our board members. It's always the people part of this type of transition that's so challenging, especially because there's so much important work to be done. The school district is phenomenal, and I can't tell you enough how proud I am to have had this opportunity. Though my time here was shorter than I had hoped or imagined, please accept my personal and professional thanks. Each of you has been consistently supportive and helpful to me throughout this past school year. As is the case in all districts, Greenwich is confronted with a number of challenging issues. In response, we established processes, offered recommendations, and made decisions. Although most people were very supportive of these actions throughout my time here, not every decision is a popular one, which I certainly appreciate having this uh, been my 11th year as a superintendent. So I'm pretty familiar that we can't please everybody all the time. We try them. I do understand that some people are disappointed at my leaving after only one year. I accepted the Greenwich superintendency planning to be here for many years. However, my family's circumstances changed and nothing is more important to me than being together as a family. I value my time here in Greenwich. I've really loved living here. I have enormous respect for the Greenwich faculty and staff and the entire community. I wish all of you nothing but the best as you embark on uh, this most incredible, optimistic, and hopeful future. Greenwich has a tremendous public school system. Uh, I, look at, I will look at this time as a highlight of my career. I will make myself available to support everyone through a very effective transition, and I'm looking forward to, um, to helping you through that. It's an amazing place. I'm really just so proud of our students and our staff and the community coming together. So I hope everybody does take this uh, chance to continue coming together and keep innovating because that's been the, the most fun part of being here. Thank you. And something tells me we'll, we'll have more discussion in that at our next meeting. All right, so with that, we'll go to the first item on our uh, the next discussion item, which is the Humanities Monitoring Report. Good 
Good evening. <coughs> In your board packet, you have the Humanities Monitoring Report for school year 17-18. The last Humanities Monitoring Report was presented to the board on April 6th and then again on May 25th, 2017. So this report is presented in five sections with a leading program summary to orient the board, specifically to new board members, on um, the program of humanity. Section one provides the common data set for review linked to the strategic dashboard. Section two provides outcome metrics with an analysis of performance. Section three is an analysis of growth within subject areas in section four, program development, and section five, some exciting next steps to be future ready. Overall, this speaks to the district commitment to a standards-based curriculum, our high-impact strat instructional strategies, and curricular intersections to fully integrate reading, writing, and social studies to facilitate deeper comprehension, learning, and to develop the capacities of the vision of the graduate. With me is uh, Ms. Lori Elliott, our Humanities Program Coordinator. So for some of you, this might be the first time meeting her. She is fabulous. And in the audience tonight, we have many um, members of our SIPL team and from our schools as well to support us um, to, sh to, again, show an ongoing collaboration between central office and the buildings in order to support student growth and achievement. I do want to take a moment to commend Ms. Elliott for her first year in Greenwich and providing leadership to the program in K-12. She has built tremendous partnerships with our teacher colleagues and has conducted a very deep analysis in her first year to develop comprehensive plans to increase rigor and alignment of our K-2 program and balance literacy, and she's going to actually speak to that tonight in, I believe, Section 4. I do also want to take a moment to thank Jennifer Lau, our research manager, for all her assistance and insight in helping to develop the data table from EFRIS for this report. And at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Elliott so that she can share some highlights um, that will focus on the strategies that we're working um, well and those that we have positioned us for some of the next steps. Thank you. So I'm actually going to start on page six um, for in table 2A. This is, um, again, since I was new this year, this is kind of where I started, just to see our um, data trends for the last few years. Um, and so I'd start with that it's, a, it's pretty obvious that there's a decline in our level four scores as students are matriculating through our system. Um, however, I'd really like to point out the fact that um, between all three years, we have an average of 75% of our students in grades three through eight scoring at level three and level four, which means um, that they are showing an adequate or thorough ability to complete their grade level skills. Um, and if you look at just level four for each of the three years, we have a steady average of 44% of all of our students scoring at the very top of that scale. So it's tremendous um, work <laughs> from our teachers and our students. Um, but it does pinpoint a point for us in, as we move forward for some planning purposes, which I'll talk about kind of towards the end of the presentation. The second piece that I would like to point out is just on the very next page in table 2B. And then an extension of that is table 2E, um, which is actually all the way back on page 10. <laughs> um, so that we can look at the SBA scores and the SAT day for us, for ELA. Um, with regard to these scores, in actual, in 3A and in grade 11, we're at just about 76% of our students, which is more than 3,000 of our students, scoring at or near the benchmark. And regarding the growth, where we're measuring the students' own growth against their own prior scores, uh, the majority of all student groups, every single student group, is scoring at high or typical growth. So again, another big win, really, for the work that our teachers are doing with all of our students. The growth tables are on pages 14 through 16. If you want to take a look at those pieces as well. They're green. We put all the growth in green. So um, the third table, which is 2C, which is just page 8, and the table uh, 2D, which is right after that. So these are our star reading performance scores. Um, these two sh charts show grades 3 through 8 
And in the fall 2017 reading at Star Reading Administration, which is Table 2C, uh, we have 79.3% of our students, so almost 80% scoring at or above benchmark. Um, in the winter administration, we go up just a little bit, 82.3% scoring at or above benchmark. And what's interesting is when I looked back in our prior reports for the coordinators before me, um, the 2017 STAR forecasted 71.9%, so about 72% of the students would score at or above on SBA, but almost 76% scored. So if we keep that trend, we're looking at meeting those goals on the very first page of all of our charts, according to this data. Um, so table 2F takes us, oh, so this is going to take us to our AP pieces for English and Antarctic Studies. So 2F and then the subsequent chart um, to A is a review of the advanced placement English courses for this last year and the assessments that accompany that. And then 2G on page 12 is the information for social studies. Um, in both the ELA and social studies, more students are taking AP exams and are scoring three or higher on those exams than ever before. So we have not only higher scores, but more students taking the exams, which is huge growth for us. As of the 2017 results, so these most current results, the Humanities Department is also at an all-time high for students scoring three or better on the AP social studies exams. So these are the best scores we have um, ever received. And then in Table 2H on page 13, this one shows all of the exams um, that our students take for advanced placement. Um, you can see that, just in a breakout, so you can see all the different types of assessments that the students take, but also our high school students took more than 1,000 AP exams last year. And then section five is the piece, um, I'm sorry, section four, um, starts on page 17. These are more of our plans moving forward, um, knowing what we see through this data, as well as um, qualitative data from the school year, and um, trying to meet our overarching humanities goal, which is that all of our students will successfully master both the ELA and social studies learning standards, and maybe more importantly, we'll be able to effectively study and critically think about how people process and document the human experience. And as we work towards mastering that goal, essentially I've kind of laid out five specific strategies that we can work on as a department. So the first one is from kindergarten through grade 12, all of our courses, um, we're going to begin the work this summer and we'll continue to um, increase the rigor of our classroom learning experiences and the way that we'll do that is ensuring a meticulous alignment between our state standards and social studies frameworks and our teaching practices. Um, several professional learning opportunities will be provided next year also to ensure teachers are able to deepen their experiences with and expertise in the reading and writing workshop model as well as implementing explicit and balanced literacy teaching in K-3. Additionally, sessions will be provided focused on increasing our awareness of scaffolded learning strategies for all learners, at whichever level they're currently at, and the implementation of culturally relevant instructional practices for all of our teachers. Time will continue to be provided for secondary ELA and social studies teachers to participate in vertical and horizontal cal uh, collaboration and goal setting. Um, we had a few of these sessions this year and they were excellent. <laughs> so we'll continue that practice next year. Um, and then we have, um, I, I say new, but then I think all the time like I'm new, so it might not be totally new, but um, a new, two new focuses for 18-19. One being um, providing targeted instructional support and vertical um, collaboration time for grades five and six in an attempt to close that gap. Uh, we do have work, of course, to do six and then seven and eight per the numbers, but because students are switching schools, it's, it's really the opportune time to, to choose those two grade levels. And our goal is, of course, that we'll increase the number of grade six students achieving at level four, and ideally we'll have 45% or more um, 
will show that thorough ability or that level four level on the 2019, so it's another year away, yeah. Um, but it'll be a 9% increase, which is kind of a big number, but I think we can do it. <laughs> so we're gonna work towards that. Um, and then also new for the 2018-19 is our summer, summer curriculum cadres will begin building an integrated humanities block at K-5. So we will no longer, um, in the long term, they'll separate reading, writing, and social studies, but instead they'll be embedded. Um, knowing what we know through the research and just our own practices, that reading and writing are intimately connected, and those authentic experiences, which we can provide through social studies, will only benefit really the students and the teachers. So another kind of long term goal for us. Ms. That's the best presentation I've ever heard in seven years on <laughs> humanities, and I'm so impressed. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Not only that, but the data is very useful to us. Good. Thank you. Um, tell me if there's any connection between the success on the AP Social Studies results and the 113A in ninth grade that has been added. Is there any link between 113A as a new class and the tremendous success on social studies AP scores? Okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, I didn't mean to ask another year. Yeah, so now are um, so for our juniors. So it, it's almost like the first set of students are taking many of AP exams this year. So you kind of need a little bit more time, I think. Yeah, to see that. Yeah. When the yes. AP, when the AP scores are published. Then Right. It would be hard to tease out one, one, right. Yeah. We can look at the 113A kids and look at their AP social studies scores. We can compare those to the not AP. Yes. Um, I'm really intrigued by the integrated curriculum, reading, writing, social studies, and I'm wondering if it's actual text specific connections, in other words, how tied together are the themes in the literature, in the social studies curriculum, and in the writing assignments? Are they all one, or is it just simply getting more practice from a variety of perspectives? The idea is to, to actually embed them, integrate all of them together. The summer work, we're gonna start this summer. Um, they actually did work last year where they worked um, to align reading to writing to social studies. So we're really in a prime place to now say, let's not separate it. How do, how do we figure out how it all layers together? So um, I've done a little pre-work on the social studies side at K-5 because it is a big task for the summer. So I separated out all of the themes per the state's frameworks in a kind of an easier to read format. <laughs> and we'll be using that as a starting place for what we already have that exists in ELA to just see natural places where the um, reading and writing can occur using social studies themes and topics. What we're trying to do with all of the curricular and, and with what we're doing with making learning personal is in some ways gamifying the curriculum too where students are going on quests through the curriculum. So by integrating, they're going on a quest through ELA writing you know, reading and social studies. And the same will be for math and science and technology, computer science. So, so just to follow up on that, I guess the vision is in a, like a third grade classroom, the students aren't going to know the difference between reading and social studies. It's just going to be a... a just well, learning. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. But in some ways, I think, I think the kids do right. like the differentiation. I'm just thinking about, they know how the day is structured and organized. So. I don't know, maybe there's some opportunity there to call things differently and the students, you know, like the structure, but right. the way that you're delivering the content sounds great. Yeah, because conversely, they start to think like, well, I only like read and write with Miss Elliot and then I do social studies things over there and we want them to see that it 
um, we do all the we do actually live here an excellent job of this already at the high school, so it's really a matter of trickling it down um, so that those students can trickle up. Yeah, definitely. So I have sort of two general types of questions, and I'm happy to start with one set and then come yeah. back to something. First, I, I, I thought the report was great. I appreciate it. And I think the, the presentation was very great because I think it went to the point and um, wonderful. The one thing I would say in terms of the data, particularly that chart 2A, mm -hmm. I think it'd be nice in the future. And this is, I think, not just for this report, but as you know, we've been thinking about what kind of data we want to see. I think the other thing is how do we make that data easier to absorb? And you know, I don't know if you guys know it. <laughs> you know, if there's right, I mean, there's a lot of narrative, but right. really, if you put that maybe in a bar graph and did in some other form, you could see it so much more easily. I mean, I'm kind of finding myself sort of trying to hop from different columns yeah, to say, okay, what's happening in this trend? And I think the other thing that's not clear to me is, you know, do you do you want to be comparing third grades right across? Or I think it was one of the math reports we had maybe a year ago where you had it shaded and yeah. you could see the line of the kid goes from third to fourth grade, right, the cohort going through. So I think those kinds of things will make it a lot easier for us to absorb the information just looking at it as opposed to reading that full paragraph to then better understand it. Um, so I think that's that was that. And then just as a little thing, that AP exam numbers are not correct. They're in that there's six, there's it's not a big deal, but on that first one, there's six years, there's only five bars, and the numbers are slightly off. Um, the concept is all there. It's yeah, all good. I can't I could speak to the 2012 part at least. Um, they told me because before 2012, our students couldn't take anything other than the lit exam, and this chart was showing lit and lang. Yes, that's true. Uh, and but, I'm only speaking secondhand. Okay, but. but under 2017, if you look at the table, 337 students took the exam. Oh, right. And if you look at the bar right. graph, that's yes, showing the, two, the 216, I mean the 2016 data. So it's just something happened with that. Anyway, that's not a big yeah. deal. Thank you. Before it comes back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just make sure that one thing. The other thing, and, and I like feedback on this, but um, having a student who just has gone through this college process, a lot of schools really only take an AP score of four. So I was wondering, I think we need to keep the three because that's standard across the nation, but whether we would want to see another column that looks at kids getting four and above, because I do think that tends to be the standard for a lot of colleges of when they will give credit. And so I think it might be nice to see that data also. So I don't know if that's something we want to consider for the future. Sure. Um, I know she's not saying this, but I want to take a different view on the AP. Um, the score is very important, mm -hmm. but I think it's it's important to, with kids taking AP for two other reasons. <coughs> Considering ninety-five percent of our kids go to <coughs> two or four. Um, Two reasons. First of all, it's a huge indicator of rigor in the transcript. So, regardless of what grade the kid got, the fact that they're actually stretching for an AP yeah. is just, it's a nationally recognized indication of rigor. So, the more kids that we can encourage to participate in that, even if they're getting a three, or maybe even still getting a two, the fact that they were reaching is, mm -hmm. is important to encourage our kids to do that. The, the other thing that, that I think is important is that's the one score that um, is nationally level. So a kid may take an SAT, they may take an ACT, but they're taking an AP. You know, an AP3 means an AP3 everywhere in the country. So to the degree that we're on this track, which we started a while ago, but it's being the payoff, particularly payoff, is the number of kids who are participating and the kids who are actually getting there. Right. That's just such a tremendous accomplishment. And if there's more that, I, I'd love to hear in one of these reports if there's more that the, should be done to help more kids get there, mm -hmm. whatever that may wind up being. You know, we talked about in summer school doing essentially bridge to AP for kids who would not take that, or other programmatic things. Um, I'd like to hear those, and I'd like to hear whether or not those should be uh, funded so that we can put more weight. Yeah, put more wood behind the arrow with a program that's obviously working really, really well. Um, I do believe the SAT is nationally scored. I'm getting some nods in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the AP is not the only uh, nationally normed test. All right, uh, Dr. Francis, and then this So I just had one more sort of data question. Um, looking at it, I was a little bit 
surprised, given that we have the ECRA model, that we're looking at growth specifically for SGA and STAR, and even, and even I have to think about SAT. I mean, I thought that we sort of had this model that took all that data, put it in, and that we're, we're not necessarily looking at individual test growth. So I wasn't quite sure because I felt like we're given separate table for each of those, and they seem like they're pretty similar. But you know, which which way in the future do we really want to look at this data? Because I think we have this model for a purpose, which is to kind of balance out that data, not necessarily make it one test specific or. But that's here, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Sorry, they looked at the growth, but that's why I was just wondering yeah. about looking at that data in that way. I know I did ask it's specific to STAR because also knowing that we still have another administration this year and um, Phil did tell me that in STAR especially they take last year's SBA and then this year's first two STARS but I'd have to ask specifically for the SBA table like you're saying in this. I know that SAT told me the same thing it's like the last standardized test they took and then anything we've given kind of in between. Miss Ribbon. I don't usually try to repeat people, but I, I did think it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I want to echo, and I don't think it was this report. There's another report where we have the data, and then we have it in paragraph form, and some of the numbers in the paragraph don't match the chart. So I think just to make it easier on yourselves as you're doing these monitoring reports, I agree with Dr. Francis. There might be a way of visually depicting it and not having to repeat it in sentence form. Because then I started to like, like really get lost. I'm like, okay, I just don't even want to read this part. I'm going to look at the visual. Okay. Ms. If I recall correctly, you have a, a challenge between grades five and, and six. That has been going on forever. And, and you know, we had CMTs and whatever. And it seems to me that there's got to be some way of looking at that, whether it's teacher preparation, time on task, uh, rigor, uh, communication between fifth and sixth grade. I don't think it's something that we should continue to, to, to let happen, that we ought to put some extra effort into that area. I do have a direct plan for next year that it's really going to focus on um, teacher actions and student actions, and it'll be focused specifically on five, six. We'll, of course, have all of the other professional learning that we'll have. Um, but we're going to focus through the workshop model and what's good right now in fifth and what's good right now in sixth and getting those practices across the schools. If it helps, you know, this is my third state and every state it's, a, it's an issue because it's the jumping of schools is what really happens. And then also in humanities, the rigor of the text itself, it, it, it jumps exponentially where between third and fourth it's a little jump and then fourth fifth is a little jump and then really between five and six and seven they're very big jumps in the text complexity measures so we're kind of trying to take all knowing all of those things what can we do starting right now and then over the next few years good i'm glad to hear that you have a have a plan yeah. <laughs> one of the strategies is to create teacher cohorts so they talk now they do meet but not regularly so we're pairing the instructional coach at the elementary level with the secondary and then with that team of teachers and creating these teacher cohorts five six You're so it's shared practice five, six. Yeah. oh I don't know what it is. So the resources will be funneled to those cohorts and increase the collaboration, the conversation, and um, really the articulation of those yeah, so strategies. Within five and six, we're going to make smaller cohorts, but then we have, I believe, five scheduled times, so one will also be like one big cohort to talk about what we're learning in our smaller cohorts and then sharing with us. Mr. Um, first of all, I apologize for being late, but I was coming from fifth grade Shakespeare play. Oh, oh, Caesar. So, Caesar. So, I am just loving the humanities program right now in general. Um, so, it's hard for me to really come off that high. But um, with that, I'm just going to jump to the high school because that's where I have um, I guess less of an understanding. So, if you, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, and so, the, and I look at the advanced placement assessments, and I'm so intrigued. First of all, I'm so impressed by how many of our students are taking AP tests, and, and the fact that that trend continues up, and that it pretty much holds for averages. Yeah, in spite of that, that's a that's a good thing. So then I just sort of looked at the comparison when you look on sorry table two H, 
where you have English literature, English language, and break all these out. So when you compare this, do you compare this nationally? I was just so intrigued. Like, I mean, obviously European history being the highest that has the smallest denominator, so that can drive that. But is this kind of how it flows nationally? Is it, you know, is macroeconomics sort of one of the harder exams? And um, uh, macro, micro, my understanding is definitely more difficult along with the government. Okay, I'm just wondering, is this how it compares nationally? You think, or is it just sort of? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you my history. In other right. states, um, it, it, I would say this is pretty, uh, as far as how many kids take the exam and at which grade levels, we do offer several of our courses earlier than most states. So mm -hmm. our students are actually taking them a year or two before many other mm -hmm. states are even offer like that for students to take. Um, and of course, our scores are high. Um, I've been trying to formulate this over the last few years, and we've talked about this, I think, in the past. Um, you know, writing, reading, critically important skills, communicating effectively, you know, really important skills. The, the thing that I have seen, and I think it really kind of came to a head for me, was seeing my, now I, I admit, ten, ten, STEM tending son and his friends trying to pick their courses, and this is going to be a little... I'm trying to think of constructive ways to say this, but the, the process of picking their English courses, unfortunately, was, uh, so which one have you guys heard is the least painful? It's, it's sort of that, and, and, I, and, I got, and it was interesting to hear my sons and my, my niece in London have the same conversation about the deep dive, the, the deep analysis of the literature. And so sort of philosophically, one of the questions I'm trying to understand is, how big a part should that literature piece be as we're looking towards personalized learning and as we're thinking about you know, looking at new electives and social studies, are there ways that we might be able to expand some of the electives um, in English that might be a little less of that analysis, challenging maybe in different ways, different types of texts, other ways of addressing this? Because a lot of these kids are strong students um, my son had the, the, you know, the, the, the good fortune of having Mr. Orlando for eighth grade English and loved English. Um, he's a good writer. He's happy to write an essay with all his opinions and send it anywhere. Um, but it's, you know, it's trying to understand what is it that's happening in these courses that's making the kids react this way. And, and, I, and I'm sure it's a small group of students, but it's still trying to understand, is there a way we could look at scientific literature? Is there, and I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's trying to understand as we're looking at kind of personalizing what is it that we're trying to get out of it. So clearly we want them communicating well, uh, you know, expressing themselves well, understanding what they're reading, getting information out of things, writing well. But how much of it has to be that deep literature dive and are there other electives that we could do maybe for 11th and 12th grade after we've gotten through some of those, those basic courses that might really pull these kids into their English courses in a different way to make them continue enjoying something that they had enjoyed earlier. And, and I just think as we have sort of those bigger conversations as we look at expanding things for social studies, are there ways that we might be able to look at this for English to pull those kids in and, and to make that experience a different one for them? Thank you. 
And the rest are open enrollment. Mm -hmm. They can self select the day. They can take the in their prerequisite classes. And in the English AP, they um, get recommendations from the teacher. Right. Um, and if the teacher recommends a non AP or recommends an on course, they can overwrite it. Right. So they come and they talk about it, they talk about what they would want to work on, and they can overwrite it. Right. Okay. And then just in terms of taking APs in the younger grades, I know a lot of schools, a lot of neighboring school districts, um, most often don't. They don't actually allow students to take their courses until their junior year just because of the, it's not just rigor, but I think the sophistication of the material to a certain degree. So is that, is that unique to Greenwich? Is that, um, um, can you expand well, on that a little bit? The, the history um, with AP and College Board historically, right. um, about three years and then before that, they actually mandated when we could okay. allow students. Mm -hmm. okay. But um, they, they let that go three, five years ago. Right. And so you could start um, students in a, it's by state, so through your graduation requirements, essentially, you can like um, compare that we have this class and so we're going to get the, the AP version of that class. Right. Um, I would speak specifically, especially to the literature and the language classes. Right. Um, I would say that even at ninth grade, mm -hmm. um, the content is still appropriate. Accessible. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you know, because we, what we face in reading is like they may be able to read it, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily something we want them to read yet. <laughs> right. Because right. they're right. too young or they're, they're not quite ready for certain topics. Um, because of the way College Board scaffolds these classes, though, mm -hmm. where we're pretty much, I would, I've never really come across anything that I go, oh, we really shouldn't. Why were they choosing to not take it? So okay. that, that's not there. So just to try and understand what are the factors that are making students take the test, but get in, and then choose not to take it. So is that something we should be considering in terms of altering or changing the course in any way? So I think um, it might be helpful if I call back to Winters to the table. Is that okay, Dr. Winters? Sure. Since, since there are two questions, I'll call back. Did 
does that make more sense now? Or, I mean, we can certainly come back prior. I don't know who I'm What these are, I'm sorry. What I just what, what you is, was. One reason is Tommy's going to run some next year. <laughs> <laughs> is not going to GHS, trying to balance work with the other honors classes. We think the English social studies one of the team presents a better option for him as a freshman. We're trying to manage Lily's stress level and don't feel like she needs to take on extra work. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The reason for declining the opportunity to join our first day classes, mainly due to all the other advanced courses that I'm taking, I feel as though I'd be able to put my best efforts into a class as hard as one for today while taking advanced math and honors bio. Uh, because it will increase the workload of my freshman year an incredible amount without giving me a better grade. So that's a small sample. And then you asked about the percentage of students who got B's or better. I was trying to understand, so, you know, one of the things that we had talked about initially um, was, you know, the percentage of kids going into 113A, sort of that part. So there was a few things that we had said were sort of philosophical decisions that the high school had made. And so trying to understand where are we with those, are there things that we feel should be reconsidered, changed, modified in any way. And so that was a data point to help me understand, like if you have a lot of kids who are really succeeding in A push, is it good or not good that they're not getting into 113A, and how, how do we feel about that? So you actually asked that question earlier, Humanities reports, and on page, um, the unnumbered page, there is uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little around in the middle, and I'm trying to find it. In my packet, the one with a little uh, ear tag. Oh, so you can look for that page. It will be numbered by that. Anyway, the. Is it English on it? Is it right down? It's kind of in the middle. It said, I'll just tell you what it says. Enrollment in April should be lying. So in 2016 17, there were 133 students who were enrolled in both those courses. So, and just for the board's sake, anyone in eight push is also an AP one. With a rare, rare exception, which does happen in the um, The number of students from who, who populated uh, eight push and AP line in 2015-16, and so that's the year prior, was 37% uh, were from 113A and 30 and 57% were for 113 so, you saw so I saw that part. I think the next point in my mind was do we have a lot of those kids who came from 113 and stretching and they really maybe shouldn't have been there and they were, you know, opting in? Or did these kids do really well and would it be even better if we had prep? So I was just trying to get a sense of of those kids who are in A push, what what and, and AP line, what so, percent of them are really succeeding and how does that compare to how many kids are in 113? Well, I think the average score on the exam is something like 4.6 or 4.7, so that, that's, that's an exactly. extraordinary, um, which means that almost everybody is succeeding. And the grade distribution uh, for the last three years in both classes is that uh, those who are getting greater than AP uh, range from 96% to 82%. Uh, and and uh, I forgot to talk about what, how many kids are now taken roughly? Um, the, the total there is from uh, 100 and 20 up to, uh, you know what, part of, no, I have, I have to break this down because he took AP line, he took juniors and sophomores, I'm oh, sorry. So I can say that A push. I didn't realize he had juniors. So A push numbers have been 2015, 117. Um, 2016, 121. And 2017, 130. And the percentage getting these are better was in that same well, order, anywhere from 82 to 93. So if I remember, it's like, so double the number of kids are succeeding in A-Push that get into, that are taking 113A, something like that. Well, I, I look at it as both 113 and 113A are preparing kids to succeed yeah. in A-Push. Yeah, there's different ways of looking at it, and that's sort of where I want to go. 72 to 85 percent of the kids who take 113A are going on to A-Push. It goes to her question. All right, well, Ms. Raven. Um, it's uh, not numbered pages, but I think it's like nine in the PDF. Um, so it's my theme on stress that the 13 A's, um, they report homework that exceeds the guidelines at a higher percentage than the other two. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but is harder class supposed to mean more homework? 
Well, I, first of all, I do apologize. I did have one set of narrative in there that was uh, off from the chart. The chart is, is correct. Um, so I, I apologize for that. The, uh, the homework, I think we have to, um, and I said this last time when we presented to the board, um, you assign a homework assignment that's supposed to be 30 minutes, and you have some students who spend 20 minutes and some students who spend an hour and 15 minutes on a regular basis. This, this is, we, we have a very, very hard time measuring. It is just the right amount. What I'm encouraged by is that the, the percentage of students who say that the homework, the homework in, in this year was straight across the board. Right? So you had 32% saying it was greater, 39% saying it was at the guideline, and 27% saying it was below the guideline. Um, I don't quite know how to interpret that other than to say I think the teachers are very cognizant that uh, the amount of homework in 113 days should be roughly the same amount as 113. Um, they have been meeting a lot, talking to each other. Lucy and Bridget have worked with them a lot to, to uh, reinforce that. Um, we've looked at differences between teachers because there's different teachers teaching sessions. Um, so it's not perfect. I don't know it would be perfect, but I do think it's it's in the right direction and it's, and it's getting in that way. So from an academic standpoint, why can't assignments be combined so that you don't have as many in each bucket, but you have certain skills demonstrated by, let's say, halving the assignments, but making connections across the disciplines? I think there's a certain amount of that happening, and I'm strongly encouraging that to happen more. That that's a matter of teacher collaboration and conferencing with each other, and uh, I think that is the general direction we're going. Mr. Chair? Uh, I was just going to build on Gates on this point. Um, my son is one of those people who go watch him, but I think it turned out like a bunch of them. He tested into 113A readily, easily. He did, we did not give him 113A. Um, he didn't take 113A. Um, he then went on to take a course in the rest, and he got either a four or a five. So I think there was in that, it, it's totally anecdotal. We asked a bunch of other parents who were you know, tracking with him, what did you do with your kid? Some of them were really high on, oh my God, I got to get the kid into 113A because I got a push rigor regulator. And then there were others who were saying, and I, as weird as this sounds, um, if there wasn't, wasn't a bump to it, and it was going to prepare the kid, what was the purpose of adding extra stress? So, you know, it's great that we have this multi-level for everybody, but the formula, if, if we're trying to figure out how to align so that when parents take a look at this, and parents are talking with their kids and helping them make decisions about what to do, it may not be quite aligned to what the educator thinks is the right thing to do and the decision then that the parent is making, right? And ideally you want those two aligned, right? What does the educator think is the right thing for that particular student because they know and they know the curriculum and they know the course and know the teachers? And what, how does the parent behave in advising the kid and what does the kid wind up getting aligned to? So just my point is in terms of the pilot, I think 113 IT apprentice was super successful. Um, there was a lot of churning around that, but to the degree you can go back and maybe talk to some parents and what you can learn out of that and any adjustments that could be made, um, you might even get better alignment. But overall, the thing sounds remarkably successful. Miss Stem. Sorry to make you give me a little bit of history course, Dr. Winters, but can you tell me how this came to be? Because this is quite different from any other class I guess we offer at high school, all the other classes you can sort of choose to go into or push yourself into and then this specifically was chosen not to be weighted and I assume that's because there's this prerequisite to it or uh, so, so. So two different questions here. Yeah. The, uh, the history of how this came to be was we, uh, we were very interested in uh, how our students were responding to freshman year classes. We had, we had two levels of English and Social Studies in, uh, in ninth grade and a lot of parents said you have three levels of biology, you have multiple levels of world language, you have multiple levels of math, why do you have just two levels of English and social studies? 
Uh, we had a lot of reasons why we liked that model, um, which we don't need to go into. Um, but we, we did surveys and we did a couple. Uh, the first time we did it, we concluded that it wasn't uh, necessary to offer that third level. The second time we said, you know, there is a small percentage of students who are saying that the pace is a little bit slower in the 113 than they would like, um, and that the intellectual challenge is a little bit lower. Um, that was pretty clear. And so we said, okay, we, we formed a class. We worked um, closely with uh, Dr. Francis um, at that time, pre-board. Pre uh, and, uh, and that was the genesis for the class. The argument, because we floated a bunch of ideas how to, uh, to meet the needs of the students who said they were not finding it either fast enough or intellectually challenging enough. Um, and including some APs in freshman year and, and a bunch of options that ultimately were not selected. Um, this was selected, but it was determined that uh, it would be kept uh, strictly on the criteria for entrance, and so it's one of the only class where we have a very uh, tight um, criteria. And you know, if if if, oh if there's enough interest in changing the criteria, we can talk about that. But for now, we've stuck with what we've done for the three years. Um, we've roughly accepted uh, 10 to 15 percent. Uh, a handful don't don't enroll, we end up with about, you know, between, usually three sections, one year we have four sections. Um, and, uh, and the idea there was that it was not meant to be more work and uh, more of a burden on students, it was meant to be intellectually challenging, slightly faster paced for students who wanted that. Um, and as a freshman level class, we didn't see any value in waiting. We didn't want to make their GPA the determining factor for entering. We wanted to make their interest in that subject. And most of the kids, a lot of kids will say, yeah, they would like it waited. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of like, would you like this piece of candy? I like right. the piece of candy. Right. Um, I get that. Right. Uh, but a lot of the kids talk about in the comments, and we read them all, is that they really appreciate the opportunity to be in this class with kids who, for the most part, are really motivated mm -hmm. to go deep into these subjects and to, to, to study. Them. There's a genuinely positive feeling about that. Right. What's interesting, though, I'm sorry, can I follow up? Sure. Um, is that then, and maybe you're, the number is, sorry, I always forget to do this. Maybe the number is that you gave were slightly different from this, but it seems like there are actually, at least in 2016, 2017, more kids came out of 113 into the A push and AP. And, and I'm, and I'm, happy that. I'm not necessarily happy, but I'm pleased that we are still, because we've always said that 113 was an advanced level class. Okay. And, and I've said to parents all the time, because a lot of them ask and say, should my side child take 113A or 113? I say, yes, we have right. very good choices. We have excellent classes, and the teachers will tell you the 113 classes are, are terrific. Um, some of those kids who are taking A push out of 113, Maybe they, they they met the criteria, or maybe they're one or two points off, right. but they're perfectly capable with their efforts <coughs> to, to succeed in those classes. So. <coughs> maybe I'm going to ask about uh, Advanced Science 6. So you're probably off of the finish one. You hang out. You can hang out. It's all right. We're, we're, we're casual here. Um, so Advanced Science 6, the first year uh, we did it, which was two years ago, I guess, because kids are in seventh grade. Right, right it's right now with the third year. Yep. So our criteria uh, basically resulted in over 50% of the sixth graders being placed in advanced science six, which tells me maybe something was different. So we changed this year, right, the criteria. So how are the numbers looking for the advanced science six enrollment? Are we still looking at that same above 50% or has that changed? Central is 50% of the Sheila? Yes. Okay. And Western is 34% and Eastern is 71%. Almost okay. 72%. So, so something tells me that we're still not doing this right. Because when we talk about an advanced class, when we're putting more than 50% of the kids in, that's an indication that we have kids that can perform at a possibly even higher level. I, I hate to say it, but maybe we need a third level of science. Um, but I don't really understand why there's so much variation among the schools. Uh, maybe that's something that you can dig a little deeper into when you come back. Um, I know this isn't not only the report about advanced science, but you, this is an opportunity to talk about it. 
Dr. Francis. Yeah, I had sort of, I was musing the same question and I actually went back to look at, it turns out I think we didn't get that report until March 22nd because I think that March 8th meeting got rained out or something. Uh, okay. But anyway, so the March 22nd report. Um, and and it, it doesn't really address this as much. And, and I think what's interesting to me in particular is, you know, these two courses, 113A and Advanced Science 6, were created around the same time. And philosophically, uh, you know, I don't, I find it really interesting that one course ended up being an absolutely strict, you can't break the rules, 15% cutoff, that's it. Um, and I understand the pros and cons to that. And that we have another course that was created at the same time for advanced students where we have a range, you know, 50% on average with one school going up to 71%. And again, in a scenario where we were told prior to the creation of that advanced course that the one that we had was perfectly challenging for all students that we didn't necessarily need an advanced course, so how we went from that course being adequate for everybody to it only being good enough for 30% in one school is a little surprising to me. So it's sort of interesting that, that, that there's such a difference in the philosophy and in the method that we've gotten to an advanced course when on average in our district, in general in our at ALP, our APUSH, AP Lang, all those things were at about a 20% that we have one place that's strictly less and another one that's significantly more. Um, and I do worry that if you've got 70% of your kids in an advanced course, that, you know, once again, you're going to have that top, whatever number you want to look at, 10, 15%, 15% in that range being sort of what's looked at sort of in general for, for advanced students, for gifted, however you want to use that language is kind of the number that you're looking at. To have one that's so significantly different makes me a little bit concerned about how we're choosing to, to have those students in there. Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to be the contrarian, shocker. Um, the reason I'm lost in this conversation is this is, a, this is a great conversation to have, but it's about yesterday's education model. It's not about the, where we're trying to go, because you're absolutely right, right? To have a higher level course and have 70% of the kids in it is the answer to solving that problem creating more leveling, right, which is, you know, in the 1960s everybody was in the same course. It took 50 years to get to the point where you had three levels, no offense administrators, but I'm going to say it out loud. There's been great resistance in the years I've been on the board on more leveling, okay. I think we've made a strategic decision just to abandon that model, right. So the model we're going to is there's infinite number of levels because learning is highly personalized. So rather than talk about how to get to more levels, I'd like to talk about how do we accelerate past this thing so that if a kid is, is there and some kid can like scream ahead and be in seventh, uh, seventh grade and they're ready to be doing you know, we have some of them in Greenwich, actually, weirdly, um, who could do 10th grade work? Excellent. And then if we have a kid who can just get to the top, 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 top of 7th grade, create the class and the curriculum and teaching methods so that they can do that, and if they're ready to go into 8th, but they don't have to have a course schedule that's tied to, you know, I got this course, this room, this teacher, these desks. And I, so the real question I have, and it's a philosophical question, it's tied to the other one. I didn't want to bring it up, but I will now. I feel like we're going up. We're moving along in personalized learning, but it feels slow. It feels super slow. And I think if we could, ex another way to go is accelerating down this path so that we don't have to have these kinds of conversations. Because your, your point's dead on. The question is, what's the remedy to it? And I, I don't know how we do that. I'd love to hear from Jill. I'd love to hear from Irene. I'd love to hear from somebody. What is it we can do to help you guys go faster to get to infinite levels instead of having a conversation two to three? I don't know if you want to respond to that. Maybe we really can't. All right. Miss Anyone on the I don't want to see us move that much faster into personalized learning. I've been around long enough to know that when we rush into things, we don't do them well. We then do them the Greenwich way or whatever. I think, you know, we should focus our energies on personalized learning, but meanwhile, I think we need to revisit 
what the criteria is for the uh, science program. We've said this before. We said it last year. And uh, because it can't be an advanced class if 70% of our kids are at it. You know, because we don't, 70% of our kids aren't advanced. And so we do a disservice to all the kids by saying, you're in an advanced class which might not be advanced, and you've got an advanced class that's not serving the needs of the advanced students. Yeah. So it's, it's a certain amount of, I don't want to say, well, it, it, it's a certain amount of not being very transparent and very true to what we say we're doing because we're really not doing it's it. It's not necessarily the criteria, just like the high school, there's overrides. So the parents have conversations with the principals and with guidance counselors. If they have that conversation and they feel that that course is in the best interest of the student, then the principal overrides the, the, just as they do in high school. I think in the high school, that's the, in 113A, I believe they did not allow overrides. But anyway, but, you know, but, but the criteria is important time. because if you can list several criteria to a parent and say mm -hmm. this is where your kid falls in a whole range a lot of them do get the message. And if the course is truly rigorous, then they will find out this is the best course for their child. That's right. That's, that's, right. Right. that's the way it happens. Ms. Daniel. I've been through them for 35 years, so I know. Well, I'm going to disagree with my colleagues on two points. I don't think the board ever made a blanket provision to eliminate leveling. I certainly didn't vote for that. Um, the second thing is, I don't think we should necessarily have the same percentages across all our middle schools enrolled in any particular course. That makes absolutely no sense. We need district-wide criteria. Um, the last point is, if you want less than 70% of kids at Eastern in a particular class, you might want to change the assessment from star reading to get into science to a science assessment type uh, short, quick, not how much do you know about astronomy, but the ability to apply scientific concepts in the classroom. I think that's how you get the numbers to be a little bit more indicative of the ability of the student in the next class. Anything else on advanced science? I think there's a confusion on if it is an acceleration model, if it's an enrichment model, if it's an honors class. You know, I mean, I think there's a little bit of um, that. The other is, remember, we're all moving to next-gen science standards, and it is a rigorous core curriculum. So the other piece of that is you're taking everybody, good news, right, everybody gets exposed, and we're seeing it in um, the fifth grade units as they're coming up. The kids are all getting exposed to really great problem-based um, learning engineering principles, you know, things I had not seen before the implementation of this. So I think that's a uh, good news item, but I do think there's a little bit of, um, I think you got to figure that out, right? Is it personalized learning accelerate the kids? Is it enrichment? Is it enhancement? And I think that helps with your criteria then too, but I do love the idea of an actual science assessment if it really is a leveled course. That's where we were, and the it was a resounding level of anxiety, and um, we were trying to make the experience um, better for the students. So certainly something to revisit. That's why we're asking to extend the pilot because we don't have the true amount of data to understand if this course even works for the students. So, yeah. Mr. Chair, but Irene, the data we need if you're going to go collect more data, and you guys want to have a conversation about overrides. What you need to do is you need to show where did the kid, we need to look at where did the kids test, and then a year later, where did they perform? Because if the argument is, is that parents in mass are overriding, and that's why these kids, you know, and then they got in there and they failed, okay, which is, which is really, the, we never complete this sentence on overrides, right, in the public. It gets said one-on-one, -on -one, right, and between educators and board members and what have you, we need to complete that sentence because the argument that's being made is parents are overriding in large numbers, that's the other part of that sentence, 
and they're doing it against the recommendation of the administrators or the educators, and the kid is failing. So if that's true, if all of those things are true, we need data to show that that's in fact true. The anecdote of the difficult cust the difficult uh, I must say it right customer, the different parent meeting, okay, because uh, everybody can tell you about the corner case. Everybody can tell you about the, the, the crazy parent who didn't listen to the result. The question is if that's happening over and over and over again at scale, then it's a problem. If it's but we need better data to know how real that situation is. And I'd like to see it in these reports if, because we, we need to know if that's real or not. And then we need to make a policy adjustment or we don't need to make a policy adjustment if it's a problem. Ms. Hernandez. I think sometimes if kids don't fail because then the course gets adjusted down because there's so much pressure on the teacher who's got to face Mrs. X now who said, but my kid belongs in there. And so the course continues to get watered down. And so we do have 70% of the kids maybe doing well in the class that they shouldn't be doing well in because it should be more rigorous. I so I think you need to control for the, for the rigor. Um, I think you have to control for admission. And I think you have to control for the rigor of the program so that it is being taught the same way mm -hmm. in all the classes so that we have some consistent data about student achievement. But it, there's been a shift, though. There, there's been more of students having access to the teachers at different times of the day to support their ability once they are in the class. So mm -hmm. they're intervening in different places throughout the day and not so much of this watering down of the experiences in the classroom. So that, that's been reported by the principals that there's been an increase of the supplemental support for the students. And parents supplement, too, some. You know, the one thing you might think about is not having the override discussions at the building level, but at a central level, because that principal, that teacher, has to face those parents all the time. So if you had a more central... At the building level. Well, that's my point. It's the, wrong, it's the wrong place. You need a more objective group of people. Nothing else on advanced science. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about seminar. I know Gordon's not here. So uh, I see the recommendation is discontinued. It's going to get uh, folded in with the, the regular science course. Is that something that's being shared with the other middle schools? Are there learnings here that might benefit uh, the other two schools? I think uh, Gordon with Yeah, it is a scheduling piece. So I know he does collaborate with Healy. Um, you know it's, it's going to be teaming. As soon yeah. as the three middle schools have the opportunity to have real teams, then they can do that. Dr. Francis. Um, so, sorry, I was just going to make one more comment on seminar, which is, you know, this seems to me, and it's maybe a segue, I don't know if we're going to Innovation Lab next, but it seems to me that this is an example, and I was talking about this at the Alliance meeting, of how Innovation Lab is really, um, I think, reaching out and having great positive effects on our schools in many ways. And I think, you know, Steminar was, was really, uh, had went, went to Innovation Lab to learn a lot of techniques and ideas to bring it to the middle school. And now I feel like it's gone from Seminar out to the other classes in the middle school. And I just think that's a great progression of learning those, of learning and, and sharing those best practices. Mr. Chair. I'm lost in this conversation. I thought the purpose of doing seminar as a pilot, it was a, it's a district-wide pilot that happened to be taken. It's nope. just for Western Middle School. Okay. It was a Saturday program. No, no, no. I'm sorry, let me finish. Okay. It was a program that was brought to us as a pilot, as a way of changing the way that we teach science in, in middle school, and it popped up, the innovation <coughs> popped up out of that school, but the purpose was of popping it above that school so that if it proved out at that school, it became integrated everywhere else. I, I think some of the practices may have, but no, it was a Saturday program specifically at Western. I, I, yeah, I know. And then they made it part of their day-to-day. -day right, and they asked us for money for that, which we gave them. Through the Greenwich Alliance, provided funds for it. And they have learned through the implementation that it, it supports all kids. And so, it, again, with Gordon's 
I, I'm on the I'm, I'm on this point. If it was successful there, the purpose of running the pilot that the board sees is so that if it's successful there, it then gets propagated everywhere else in the district. I think I just heard and I think we have a little Central bit of. Are able to do that with the changes in the schedule? I can't speak to West uh, Eastern right now. Can we find that? Sure. All right. Anything else? We do, and we are doing. Chris Winters and Middle School, they're doing a great job. Irene and Chris, uh, middle school, a couple of the reps doing a great job with secondary school, reimagining, revisioning. That's where all this kind of uh, thinking is coming forward. So that's exciting. <laughs> all so right. Well, there's nothing, if there's nothing else on seminar, uh, innovation, lab. innovation lab. So thanks to the team for coming. Thank you. Yes. Um, so if you do have questions, I will call Dr. Winters back to the table. And then perhaps you can introduce his team, Mr. Kim, with us this evening. So we have um, a couple of founding fathers and, and a new person. Uh, Brian Wallach has been uh, since the beginning, and he is the uh, math, uh, primary math teacher. We do have a, a partner in math with him now. And Christina Shaw was also uh, from the beginning, and she's the program associate of the program. And Courtney Hawes joined just after the planning year, but at the first year of implementation. Um, and they all worked diligently on this report. Um, and through. Uh, so are there questions about Innovation Lab? Misty. Thank you for the acknowledgement in the report that we have a little work to do on the math sequencing. But I believe it's not just for the, quote, average student. I didn't say average, it's in the report. Um, I think it, that we really need to look at math across the board for all abilities. I think it's a tremendous addition to Greenwich High School. There's no question in my mind that it's the future of learning. There's no question our teachers have worked with the utmost care and intelligence and foresightedness possible. We're running into a problem where we want to have time in classroom for the hands-on, but we also want to succeed in a paper and pencil test. That's, that's the tension. So we succeeded with the SAT. It's just out of the ballpark. Thank you so much for the additional practice for the SAT. We're running into a little bit of trouble though when you get to the SAT 2 subject tests in terms of preparation um, and I have an independent assessment that if you want to take the SAT 2 in physics for example we didn't hit every part of the curriculum in order to do well and that's because perhaps we can't under this model they're doing what they can but it's very difficult with math and physics not to cover every single standard and then be expected to take these somewhat ridiculous SAT2 tests to get into college. I don't value them, and I don't know why the colleges value them. I think if you can do the general SAT test for admission, that should be sufficient. But some schools, are still stubbornly insisting on those SAT twos. So how can we fix the standardized test problem and the math sequencing problem that you've already noted? Can I actually make one quick comment? We spoke, we spoke with a lot of, I personally spoke with quite a few college um, admissions people this year. Because we had our first group of seniors, and we had some great news, and we had some disappointing news. It was just like we had across Greenwich High School. We had a lot of students who got great news, and we had a lot of students who, this was a very hard year um, for admissions. Um, one thing I'll tell you, a typical story, this is, it's, it's anecdotal, but it, I think it's, it's typical of about four or five people I spoke with. The, uh, Allison Lockridge reached out to this person. The person uh, emailed back from the airplane 
and said, I don't have the student's file in front of me, but I know all about this person. I know that this person was in Innovation Lab. I know what this person did in, in the projects and how they presented. Um, and ultimately, uh, it, it, they said there were 12,000 uh, applications for 425 spots, and she didn't get it. Um, but what I took from that was they knew the story. And that story, and that's what we want. Um, the SAT is a little tiny, the SAT 2, is a little piece of, of, of a story. Um, but I think we can tell a much more powerful story. Um, the more college um, admissions people know the program, understand the program, and, um, and get to know what these kids are actually accomplishing, I think they will overlook that. They will look at that far more than the SAT 2. Um, that said, I didn't answer your question very well because you're asking a fundamental question, which is to the extent that we focus on standardization, we produce standardized products. And Innovation Lab is trying very hard not to produce a standardized product. Um, I was thrilled to see that the SAT scores on, on a whole were rising faster than, than Greenwich Public Schools as a whole. Um, but, uh, you know, I've always said the, the, the key to Innovation Lab is going to be in the story. It's going to be in the individual. It's not a cookie-cutter model. Um, and I think this team worked extremely hard. Allison Lockridge, who's our college and career um, counselor, has been compiling data and speaking with every available rep about Innovation Lab so that they understand, and that's um, ultimately our story. A couple of them said, the strength, the, a weakness in their application was that their personal essay didn't line up enough with what Innovation Lab was trying to accomplish, which was really good feedback for yeah, us. Um, one school said, you know, when you had 86 kids from Greenwich High School apply for our school, um, and they, they stacked up the number of AP classes kids took. And that, that did not help um, one particular mm -hmm. child. So we, 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 have to, we have to deal with that too. If I might chime in another place where we could show rigor, uh, and I find feedback from the counselors, is through the school profile that we add uh, to the, the college application. Um, and in that, I think we need to highlight how our rigor is different from take an SAT2. I think it's pretty loud. So instead, the counselors feel that we should highlight how we have depth and not necessarily breadth. And that the students, we work with the students on their college essays to highlight the kinds of projects that they do uh, that would show that okay. and illustrate that. As far as uh, talking specifically to the SAT2, just as we help them with the SAT, uh, this is good feedback for us. We can certainly prepare them for these tests because uh, we do allow for some of that to happen within our design studio um, elective. And uh, we currently have some sophomores who have decided they wanted to take the advanced placement test for American history. And we, in hearing that, did prepare them for the exam. Okay. So there are ways that we can, but again, our focus is the depth and not necessarily the breadth. So it wasn't um, something that we were really no, focused on. I get that. But, I totally get that. Yeah. If, if I could add just a little bit of explanation to that. Um, if you look at the next generation science standards, so I'm, not, I'm a math teacher, but um, I co-teach the class. So read up on the standards. And if you look at what the next generation science standards are that pair with physics, not all of them that are in the NGSS are on the SAT2. So if you look at where our science classes are going to be going with a larger focus on earth science, um, you're, some of those physics topics are going to drop out of physics curriculums, not just in Greenwich, but in other places. So I would expect that if the SAT2 still wants to test high school physics, then they're going to have to change based on, you know, Connecticut standards versus other state standards. Okay, that's um, helpful. So. Great. Dr. Francis. Thank you for Yeah, but I'd also like to add that having one kid in and one kid not in Innovation Lab, even your standard courses are not always strictly preparing for the SAT2. So, you know, for a lot of kids who have taken even AP level courses or other courses, there's clearly, you're like, okay, now that you've finished that course, you need to go figure out what's different that's in the SAT2 it's, it's, so it's not just Innovation Lab that's not necessarily hitting all the marks on that. That's sort of our general curriculum doesn't necessarily hit all the marks. And so there's that time where you've got to say, okay, what's missing? And most of the teachers, even in the regular classes, will say, okay, here's my PowerPoint, or here's my something that you can go look at, or here's a book that you go through to find those missing parts. Um, so even our standard classes are not necessarily hitting all the marks for that either. They're not geared to necessarily match 
I did have a question because I didn't actually understand what the issue was with the double up or the mass sequence. What I don't really know what that means, uh, what the problem right. is there. Yeah. Were you referring to the like whole geometry situation? Yeah, yeah. 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 You guys get two out of three. Um, what was the question? Oh yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, exactly. So the issue is that when students are freshmen at the high school, most of the students are in either Algebra 1 or Geometry. That, is, that represents 85% of students at Greenwich High School. Which means in their second year, their sophomore year, they're also going to be in a different math class. Uh, so what we end up doing is saying, if you've taken Geometry, come to Algebra 2 with us as a sophomore. If you've taken Algebra 1, come to Algebra 2 with us as a sophomore. And that's so that we can get them all in the same class. Because teaching Algebra and Geometry in the same science class just wouldn't make sense. So we made that decision with the understanding that some students wouldn't have taken geometry yet. And what they end up doing is there's a summer school option in geometry, they can double up on math either during their sophomore or junior year. We have a couple students who are gonna do it as seniors, which is not ideal because it's a required course, but unless they don't pass geometry, just like not passing senior English, you know, they're gonna graduate and it's not gonna be an issue. Yeah, um, the SAT now only is about 10% geometry, whereas it used to be 30, 35%. So we don't see that as a large issue for them. And if you look at the topics that are covered, they're covered in middle school. So all of those standards they should hit, a little bit of review, there shouldn't be an issue. And I think our students have shown on their own SAT scores that it wasn't really an issue for them. Um, but you're right that it does create a burden on those students who have to now fit a math class into their schedule, either double during sophomore, double during junior, and we just, we haven't figured out a way to get around that yet, but we work with the students individually to try and make it work in their schedule. So, so my fear is that it's uh, making some students reconsider applying because if they're average in math, then they're thinking, well, if I'm not strong in math, the last thing I want to do is take two math classes. And uh, in Innovation Lab, we appreciate that demographically we represent the wider high school, and our fear is that it'll be a program for honors level students, and we actually prefer it to be diverse. Mr. Chair. I remember when you showed up the very first time, Ms. Sarah, who's not with you, and you guys talked about um, Innovation Lab. So I actually Rose. 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 Don't mention that name. We didn't like that name. I was okay with that name. But anyway, you're not there. No, sir. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I, dis I disagree with, I'm, I'm not sure I understood where my colleague was going, but I, I would take a different view. The reason I got so excited about this program as a pilot when it was first brought was we hadn't talked about personalized learning, we hadn't thought about any of that stuff. We just had the high school the way it was. You guys went and did the high tech high thing out saying, yeah, you did all that. And you came back and said, hey, there's a set of kids who need a different way to learn, and we're not getting to them, right? And we said, okay, great. Go away and try to figure out a way to get to those kids. I don't want to have the debate about how broken college admissions is in the United States. We could go have that conversation, you know, until the cows come home, right? Probably we need wine and beer for that or something else. Um, but... The high school, Greenwich High School, has a very well-developed, fully integrated program to get kids who are dying to go get, you know, the highest scores on standardized tests that they need to get to, to go fit into that system. SAT twos, obviously ACT and SAT are standardized, but now we're in a place where kids are gaming which one to take, was my point earlier, vis-a-vis -vis AP. We have a system for those kind of kids and the parents who want those kids to go down that route. We have a system that's like highly, highly optimized for that. And I would hate Innovation Lab 
to it was serving a bunch of kids that, and that may not be what's most important to those parents and those kids and their educational programs. They were looking for something else, to your point. They were looking for depth. They were looking for hands-on. They were looking for something that was different. And the values associated with their high school experience may have been a little bit different. I would not try to bend Innovation Lab towards that model that we have that, you know, put a value judgment was good or bad. I, I think what you guys had and why you had it and you, uh, why you envisioned it rather and the values that you articulated because there is, there are a group of students and their families who want that model and now it's available at Greenwich High School to try to bend all of these diverse offerings back towards that crazy system. Um, I would discourage that. I would not support that. Um, the the other thing, though, which I just is kind of a question in this, the one touchstone for me that made me feel comfortable with this is it said, regardless of which program you're going through, whether you're going through Abbott, or whether you're going through Innovation Lab, or whether you're going through a super overcharged AP program, or whether you're going through the standard course offerings, or whether you just decided to do honors, there's so many choices now, which is the wonder in my book of Greenwich High School. The one constant was they all teach the same curriculum to the same standards. Um, so it shouldn't matter because the kid comes out on the other end and they should have gotten it all because it was all to the same curriculum standards. I wanted to confirm that's still true for Innovation Lab because I think part of what uh, Ms. Dayton was intimating, and I don't understand, is that there may have been some standards that that, that statement of it's the same standard, same curriculum, you get the same, you just get it in a different way. Is that still true? Yeah, I mean, that's. Because I heard the geometry conversation and I hear the. I'm just wondering if there's gaps that we need to work on. I mean, to the point that we mentioned about the physics, it's, I, it's as. The courses are as similar to each other as any other two courses okay. of the same thing at Grand Okay. Yeah, our seniors, when they enter, uh, we only have for Innovation Lab two courses that they take. Uh, some are in break, and they re-enter traditional classes. And um, we have data to prove that they were as successful as the rest of the Greenwich High School students. In fact, we have 33% uh, of our seniors that opted to take honors level math courses, albeit statistics, AP, and statistics over uh, calculus, but the, that was higher than the 28% for the average high school senior. So I believe that there's data to prove that our students are doing just as yeah, well right. as the rest of right. high school. Uh, I know that uh, Courtney can speak to the humanities, uh, as can I. We both teach inside and outside of Innovation Lab. I teach on a specifics outside of Innovation Lab to give the exact same final to those students that I give to my Innovation Lab students, and they are equally prepared. My senators, just stay true to your mission, stay true to your values, stay true to your concept, and keep going. In my sister, we do constantly discuss the, the risk of progression. Yeah, yeah, it's so, great. Wonderful. So that is, that's on the board. All right, so, Mr. I constantly ask. Two quick questions. I know right now you're in. I know right now you're in recruiting mood, um, but is there ever a time when you have to say too many people in this program? What is the maximum number that this program can handle? I can't wait for that problem. I know. <laughs> I know it's a good problem. But when we have that problem, I think that, uh, we'll we're thinking in the future, and I know that Dr. Richards would probably be the best person to speak to this issue. It's a building problem. Uh, the rooms that we have, the classrooms are traditional, and so there's only a certain amount of students that we can fit in each classroom. Ideally, we would love for cohorts to be between 35 and 40 students with two teachers in the room. But in order for that really to work, right now in our junior year cohort, we have about 30 when they're tripping over each other within the traditionally sized classroom. So I think that right now, our cohorts are maxed out at 30 or so. We would love them to be bigger, but in order for that to happen, I think that the rooms need to be manipulated. So, so stick around for the master's facility. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more follow-up question. No, no, no. I would say that the, the master's facility plan does envision exactly what Christine was just talking about. They really, uh, 
What's with the trend of a lot more men and a lot fewer females in the program? I honestly don't know, and it's very upsetting to us because we pride our, we pride ourselves on having um, a cross section of students from Greenwich High School, sure. and so we don't understand why that's happening. Um, the first cohort was pretty much 50-50, and it seems like every year we have more now young men who want to do the program than young women, and that's certainly not what we want to sell. We don't want to sell this as a STEM program that's for boys. Right. Uh, so um, I think we need to think a little bit about how we recruit and market. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that for teenage girls, the, the, again, this is all anecdotal of based on focus groups and things that we've done to uh, ask students why. I think girls worry about social life uh, more at 14 and 15, uh, maybe, and uh, the fear of alienation, which is a, a problem across the board. Uh, a lot of the students are fearing that innovation lab will alienate them from the rest of the high school. Once they join, they realize that not it's not true, mm -hmm. and that they enjoy uh, classes with other students in the wider high school, the student center, and that actually we have to kind of kick them out of innovation lab because they love the community. Okay. Uh, but I believe that maybe that is more of a pressing issue for young women than young men. Okay. But to be fair, mm -hmm. at the sample size that you said, we're looking at three or four students would swing that back to even. Yeah. So Still like I don't think. Time. It's, it's not something I notice. I don't walk into my class and just see a bunch of boys. I think, again, if you just if replace three guys with three girls, you're at 50 50. So, <laughs> um, so, so, so I'll say your, your students are your best brand ambassadors. Um, I've been to the exhibition nights at Dart Street. They're phenomenal. I make my kids come with me. Sorry, I have two boys. Uh, one is seemingly interested, so we'll see. Well, they wanted to come with science tonight, so I. Right. Yeah. We said please not, not tonight. Uh -huh. Right on the 14th. All right, Dr. Francis. I'm just sort of curious, and I, I was sort of playing with the idea of which way do I think this ability to take either the STEM or the humanities is going to play out. You know, part of me is like, oh, you love science, so then you're going to come take the innovation lab science, or it's like. No, I really love you know A push and AP Lang, and you know science is really thing, but maybe innovation lab will make it okay. Like I, I can't quite picture how that's going to impact or change sort of the student profile or who's going to be taking what or how they're going to decide. Do you have any sense of how that's going to go? Well, our hope is that once we get our <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is but specifically. Right. I, I could say that uh, we're only opening it for the sophomore pilot because we were hoping that that would attract students for whom the fear of alienation was a concern. Um, so far, only two students have opted uh, to take that. And one is opting to join the humanities because she is one of those average math students. And uh, actually, her counselor is the one who suggested that she only take the humanities. And the other one said it's STEM or nothing. I'm not sure why. She's not in um, a push, but that was her feeling. She is a math science person, so we're convincing her to stay. <laughs> uh, but I do think uh, uh, there are many students, uh, you have one, uh, who probably would have joined for the STEM, and I think uh, made leaps and bounds in the humanities. Uh, and so I, I see what you're saying. I would, I would actually disagree in that really? I think it was that somehow Oh, I'm sorry, because this is a theme, I think, for me for tonight. But Innovation Lab, humanities seemed more palatable, I think. Um, and so, you know, somehow that it was going to be different or something else, I think, for him actually made that part better. And I think he also liked the idea of the STEM part. Not that I can actually get him to explain his thoughts all that clearly, but that was my sense of it. Okay. All right, anything else on Innovation Lab? All right, team, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow we have a group from Reading, uh, Area 7, coming to visit with us. So I'm so excited. Um, I, I just, I already had one last question, but not related to anything on here. Um, I thought Library Learning Commons was going to be here. That is it's still a pilot. It is still not by the board. So if there's a desire, I, I think, at least to discuss with us at the June meeting, where that stands and whether you actually want to move forward with that. Um, and I know that that came up for us when we were working on New Lebanon. It's just still out there. And I know we've done some piecemeal things that we want to do that.
All right, moving on, uh, the next is a master plan update. Ms. O'Donnell, come on down. Hello. It's working, right? Um, so just a quick update on the master plan. Uh, we had a community forum on May 22nd, which I thought went uh, really well. We got a lot of great feedback from, from the community and certainly, I think, um, you know, provided some good direction for the board and for administration. Uh, we also had a board retreat on, or a special meeting of the board on Thursday um, that we started preliminary discussions on the prioritization process and what that'll look like. And so, um, KG&D is currently working on doing a little bit more work on that prioritization. Um, they will present you know, that final product, or at least their recommendation of that final product, and they will also, um, we will start to see their recommendations on placements of all those programmatic um, improvements that we've been hearing from them on. Uh, so they will be attending the June 14th meeting and we'll provide an update at that time. So Mr. Dunn, I know there was a request from board members and I'll, I'll echo it. We would like to have those materials in advance so that we're prepared to discuss them. So usually we get the materials the Friday before the board's meeting, and that would be very helpful in this instance. Um, and I, I know there's, the draft book has still not been presented to the board. Mm -hmm. I, I think in order for the board to do its prioritization work, we're going to need the detail that goes behind it. It's a very it's a lot of detail. It's a lot of detail. Um, it's a lot of detail. Uh, yes, I mean absolutely. It's it's in, it's in draft format right now. Um, it is a lot of information to absorb. It's a summary of you know all the work that they've done to date. Um, yeah, it, it pretty much is that. Um, so we're hoping on June 14th to provide that sort of high level overview of what the next steps are, so that we can get some direction for our summer work. Are the books posted? Yeah, it's still a draft form once it's mm -hmm. filed. But do we have a date as to when we anticipate it being filed? We hope everything's finalized by June 14th. Okay, uh, we're going to want that a couple days beforehand, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Sure. If that data isn't even accessible, uh, I, 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 how? I don't know. So what we, you'll. When we, we came away, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, we came away with there were seven or eight categories. Five of them were all about. It was called maintenance, and I think it was called infrastructure. It was what windows need to be replaced, what roofs need to be replaced. I, I think we came out of the meeting, I was like, I said, I'm not qualified to grant that at all. Because that's going to be based upon the assessment of engineers and architects. Right? But then there were two columns that were tied to the policy decisions we were making that were programmatic. Um, if I wouldn't know how to, I'm not going to even attempt to do the ones that are infrastructure or maintenance. Mm -hmm. But the two, if we're going to do this ranking exercise for the two that are programmatic, most definitely need the details of what is in those proposals. Now, if they're not available online, I don't even know how to prepare for that discussion. All right. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you a suggestion because when, at the retreat, what you sent us back with was, Russ, why don't you give us your best guess on this, you're the expert, you've done all this work. So he's done that, so he's filled out you know, the, the rubric the way he would. I will tell you that as a Board of Education, believe it or not, believe it or not, your job is not to uh, deeply analyze the work of the architect. But typically those books go to the administration and they will inform our year-to-year -year capital plans for you. You will not have any better luck after looking through that book, unless you happen to be an architect or an engineer, than you would right now sitting and just talking about it. So typically, as a board, other than a curiosity, um, you're not going to sit there and analyze where it's going to help you, that book, is when you're going to decide if you're going to replace or renovate a facility, because it's going to give you the price of that building. So when you start looking at some of the prices, you're going to say, are we really going to renovate this for that much, or are we going to think about a rebuild? 
um, which are far in the future. Those aren't the first couple of years. Um, but we're gonna be able to give you, before the 14th, a good idea of what his um, ratings rubric is so that you can see that. And he's not doing for the whole thing, is he? No, we, that's not what we said when we were in that meeting. The ratings rubric? That's what I thought you sent his, the direction, yes, for us to do that. Uh, people here said yes. They're yes. saying yes, but not yes. ahead. Yes. So he has done that with Lori and I. He showed us um, and told us his rationale of how he did that. But again, you know, we're, we can all study the book, as you said, summer reading, and we're still not going to come up with anything more in that. There's going to be nothing in that that says, wow, because I have <coughs> this line, I'm going to prioritize Old Greenwich. That's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? There's, there's a, a, what it's going to inform is your capital improvement plans. It's going to give you those good buckets, those good categories to say this is what we're doing in electric, this is what we're doing in you know, lighting. That's going to be great. But I don't think you're going to have to study that to be able to do the rubric. Right. So what I had hoped for and asked for and on one of eight is a final product on the 14th that shows the convergence of factors that will allow us to prioritize an actual building. So where there's a shortage of square footage and there's a need for ADA access and there's a need for an elevator and there's a need for a cafeteria, that would help us. Um, I would love you to put in words what product we'll receive on the 14th. So. I need to visualize in my mind, are we going to see a timeline with actual buildings in the timeline? And will underneath each building, will it say, and it hits four of those rubric factors, or five of those rubric factors, and that's why it's positioned the way it is in the timeline? Yes and yes. So yes. Okay. Big what, right. Big right. Relief. Yeah, so you'll see the prioritization, the rubric completed, it'll, that'll be his recommendation. Uh, and then you'll actually see this timeline, and you've seen the history um, at the community forum, that timeline of investments that you know, Greenwich has made over the years. Uh, and, then, and then you'll see the placement of his recommendations for the programs that he has presented um, in the future over the next 15 years. Uh, we talked about possibly modeling a 15 and a 20 year for you, so you can see the impacts of both of those. Um, I think it'll be a good discussion, but I'm just trying to point out that it, it will be a little bit more high level instead of you know going through all the details of the book. I think it'll put everything That's into okay. perspective for you guys. Okay, so we'll uh, look forward to getting those materials in your desk at 14. Yeah, for us to try to website accessible, accessible, create a website accessible PDF, 11 by 17, 400 page book is a lot. Yeah. That because it's not written that way. So, but you can come and see them. You can have one. But to I, no, I don't. Jill, I, don't. I think you're making a mountain out of more. The point I'm trying to make is quite simply: is if I'm going to sit down and do the priority, you're going to ask me to do a prioritization exercise. You want the details? You want the details under it? Yes. And, yes. And we've always had a watchword here in the board that we don't want the administration creating special content for the board. Mm -hmm. Because that absorbs administrative resources. So all these documents exist. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, right, right. So what I'd rather, and, and they're all accessible to the board. I come down to the building and look at it. I yes. can ask for it, but I have yes. I know Russ, obviously, he already has it in the file because he has to create it in a PDF to print it out in the first place. So I want to create new work. Whether you want to put it in board docs and the public doesn't see it, I, I don't want to get into that debate. My point is, is that I need enough detailed information about what was recommended in the programmatic half, the 350 million, the 400 million is maintenance, the 350 million is programmatic. I need enough information to be able to go through it to participate in this exercise in a meaningful way. Because, and that's all I'll ask. So if you guys can figure out what's the best way to do that, I'm gonna tell you, you have to come to the building to look at the document, or you have an abbreviated version you think I should look at, I just don't want anybody creating anything new because we got enough to do in this building without creating new documents. I think you're going to have a nice um, executive summary, which is the first 16 pages, which gives you the narrative of all of it. I think the timeline is going to help tremendously. The, tr the timeline itself um, provides a lot of uh, detail. The financial chart, there's a financial chart of what we've been spending and what the prediction is to spend on those things, those programmatic and the um, 
the actual building work. I mean, it's it's really an it is excellent work. It's an excellent um, product uh, with a great amount of detail. But again, there will be board decisions along the way because just because he, there are three schools, let's say, right, three elementary schools that really need this modernization probably more than the others because of the accessibility and safety of the vestibule. But the board really needs to decide whether that's, you know, which order, one, two, three, whether you want to do them in a bundle. You know, all that stuff is really the, the important board work. So we have to figure out how much time you want to spend on the underling stuff and how much it's, you want to spend on that high level level stuff because the high level stuff are the part that we need the community engaged in all of your um, feedback on. So those will be the kinds of things that will be really helpful. All right. We will uh, look forward to getting those materials before the 14th and having a uh, discussion at that point. All right. So the next item is the Hamilton Avenue Field Improvements. So done. Um, so this project was a project that uh, we committed to moving forward as an interim appropriation back in October. Um, it's, it has taken some time to pull together, you know, the history, to review the history of the project, um, meet with the uh, school and the community, um, uh, the community stakeholders, um, but we're excited to finally be able to present um, the Hamilton Avenue Field Improvements for um, for your consideration. So I'd like to invite uh, Dan Watson up here to join us. He's been uh, leading this project and working with um, with our stakeholders. Well, Dan's walking out, and I just want to say I saw somewhere that the, the uh, occupancy permit is going to be soon. So yeah. knock on wood. Call Dan. Call Dan. <laughs> so All right. Yeah, we'll definitely keep you posted on that. We have a final walkthrough with the uh, fire. You gotta speak in the microphone. Please. No. No. So, with regards to Hamilton Avenue, uh, as Maury said, uh, we've taken another look at what's going on there. We've got some background on it. We've met with the uh, local constituents. We've heard from the administration at the school. Um, we've met with just about everybody who has a say what I feel. Um, we've gone through the history with uh, Malona McBroom who's provided some cost estimates and some different uh, scenarios that were brought forth last year and for whatever reason they it didn't go any further. Um, we've asked them to come back and look at it again for us uh, after meeting with again with the, the local stakeholders and we're I don't want to say we pared down some things, but we looked at things in different ways. Um, uh, and we have uh, uh, Malone and McBroom here tonight, Ryan Chinaliski, who's more than happy to go over the, the plan that was submitted to the board a little while ago. So, um, uh, Ryan, you want to? Sure. Would you like uh, a digital up on the screen, or I have to pull your process? So for the benefit of new board members, the history on this project was way back when we got two proposals. One was for $253,000 that didn't level the field. And the other one was for $710,000, which was too high to be acceptable to the finance board. And that's why you're seeing a proposal now that's in the middle. from Hamilton Avenue he's in the lawsuit settlement around the garage. Are, are any of those funds still without more or were those used to deal with some of the uh, some of the issues that we needed to resolve uh, to get the permit? We're working through uh, closing out the final um, 
expenses for the Hamilton Avenue project, there were some additional expenses that were required for um, obtaining the CFO. Uh, so there should be a good amount of money still remaining, um, but we're actually seeing this as a separate uh, a separate request. We did review the educational specifications and um, the specifications didn't specifically speak to uh, leveling the field. It spoke to returning the field to a like new condition. And so we're, we're considering this an interim appropriation, a separate project from um, the Hamilton Avenue building project. Well, if I recall, some of the leveling issues were created when they put in the field German well. That's fair. Yeah, so there were really a leveling field there once upon a time. That's what I understand. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to clarify that we don't need any more funds to get the CO. Correct. So, we, so, so when we go for the interim, it will be for this. We're not going to have to go back from other monies related to this project or with that. So, I mean, pending tomorrow's final, uh, what we believe is a final walkthrough, if we get an all clear on that, then no, we don't need to ask for any more money related to the building uh, project, the Hamilton Avenue building project. So they would get this money released back to them soon, right, as soon as the uh, committee turns the, the building over to the board of that officially. And then separately, we're going to try to move forward with this interim appropriation. So two separate tracks, if that makes sense. Right, but we don't want to go to the RQ twice for money. We will not be going to them twice. Okay. And just one last question on this. Um, are there any state reimbursements outstanding for this project? Yes. And what is our expectation in the timeline? How much money and when do we expect to actually get it? For um, which project? For, okay, so for, for the school building itself, because you have to close out. Right, for Hamilton Avenue, right? Okay, so for Hamilton Avenue, uh, we need the CFO in order to, uh, in order for the building committee to um, submit the, turn the building over to the Board of Ed uh, as complete. Um, so we hope that'll be happening you know, in the next couple of weeks, depending on administratively, you know, all the paperwork of the, on the CFO that needs to come through. Um, once the building, once the Board of Ed accepts the building as complete and we have recorded minutes, we have to have them notarized and that gets submitted um, to the state along with the final payment request. Uh, we are working with the Clerk of the Works from the New Lebanon Building Committee project to, <laughs> to have him uh, help support us in this effort. Um, there is a lot of administrative work that has to happen to pull together the final um, request for reimbursement. Uh, once that happens, then the project will be audited, um, and at that time they'll release the final payment um, along with the 5% that's being uh, withheld. Um, I think for Hamilton Avenue, if I recall correctly, we were looking at about $100,000 or $140,000. Good evening. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, it's good to see familiar faces, and I see some new faces. So, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Ryan Chmielewski. I'm a licensed landscape architect in the state of Connecticut. I work for my loan McBroom. And I've been, I've had some history on this project from its inception on making um, adjustments to the field. And so I'll just bring you up to speed of where we are today. On this diagram here, this is the existing conditions. Not really pretty, it's a black and white uh, plan. However, um, I'm going to try to bring this up with me because I can't sit. And the, the laser pointer does not work on this screen. So. Um, so up in the top portion of the field, you see the skinned in field for the, for the existing baseball field and the diamond pattern up there. So the first step here is going to, that's the only spot where there's good topsoil on site right now. So we're going to strip that off and save it and stockpile it for reuse later. <laughs> the rest of the site um, in the light gray hatch area is poor soils. Um, compacted construction debris mixed in with the soils, hmm. not great for growth, and um, that is going to be stripped down and pushed into the far side. Once we do that, we're going to import about a foot of free drain material, it's like septic sand almost, and then topsoil on top of that. 
The main purpose of this, so the difference between, I'll skip to the next. So the main purpose of this um, exercise was the construction from the school left an uneven playing surface um, from the parking lot level down to where the existing field is. Um, generally, ball fields are anywhere between 1% and 2%, which is a very flat grade. This, the mid slope in between was around 5% in some areas. Um, so we're essentially taking everything and making it level. There's a lot of underground issues here. Um, there's several geothermal wells. There's underground uh, stormwater detention up on top here. There's a basketball court over to the left. There's the perimeter walkway. So this is the main difference from last time. The perimeter walkway we weren't touching last time. We were grading out the field, trying to match grades as best as possible, but what it did, it created, and we we're trying to save the LA of trees um, on the east side of the, of the walkway. But what that did was uh, create abrupt changes in the outfield of baseball. It created to have uh, the need for fences um, on the upper tier. So what this concept does, lift everything up simultaneously, except for the basketball court. Um, and so you'll have one level smooth surface across the whole thing. The area shaded in gray is all the area, or the perimeter sidewalk, which we'll need to raise. There's a, on the bottom left by the basketball court, we're putting a, an expanded paved play area. That was per the request of the, of the school. Um, and replacing in kind at this point, um, there's different thoughts on how many trees to put back, but for the tree regulations, it's a one for one, and if sometimes there's not more if requested, so we're sensitive to that. Um, so a, a couple of the features, we're, we're trying to maintain accessibility to the existing playground. Um, on the low side, in the center core of the playground, we have a set of concrete steps there to so kids could come in and out of the playground um, if they want to run right onto the field. Um, when we're and we're providing some under drainage really to protect the basketball courts because we're going to be filling, we're going to be creating a, a gentle slope towards the basketball courts. Um, we're proposing putting a, a drainage system to protect the, the water flow onto the basketball courts and degrading the surface in a more rapid fashion than it really should be. Hmm. Can I ask a question about sure. the playground? So there'll be steps up to the field, but it's still um, handicapped accessible from the school building to the playground? Correct. So all the walkways are 5%, um, which is your AD, ADA maximum without handrails. Um, so the, I'm going to get to the pretty picture now. Okay. There we go. Thank you. That's a little better. So yes, um, we're tying, this walkway is going to be 5% here, and you could come down if you're coming from the main entrance here. So that's your accessible route into the playground. Um, and if you're in the basement level, you're still at grade down below. If you're, sorry, if you're going from that playground up the stairs, mm -hmm. how many feet difference is there? Uh, it's minimal. It's, it's like three or four risers, so 18 to 24 inches. And are you putting handrails on that staircase? Yes. It's required. Yeah, the, the little, even though there's another little kid playground, the kindergartners like to go there. Just, that works. Yeah, so at an elementary school, the handrails, um, by code, you have to have uh, two levels of handrails. Mr. Chair. So Ryan, uh, two questions. You were saying you're going to, I guess you're going to strip out all that walkway and then relay it, right? So, and the trees, you have to take them down because you want to fill that in, so you have to replant them? Yes. Okay. 
And then the last thing it says is it says, I think it said in the document, it says replacing fencing, um, mm -hmm. particularly on the perimeter. Can you explain exactly where that is and what fen fencing is being replaced and why it needs to be replaced? Sure. Well, the replacement of fence is really the backstop. Yeah, but it also says, so, I, think it, I think it also says fencing elsewhere needs to be replaced. Yeah, there's a few spots. Um, it's along the property line to the northeast. It comes off of Charles Street. There's an existing fence. We're going to remove it, stockpile it, and put it back in place because we have to we have to grade essentially almost up to the property line to level everything out. Uh -huh. okay. So we're gonna, instead of burying it and having no effect, we're going to bring it up to the top of the slope now. The other area is. Um, uh, right to the north of the basketball court, there's a small section of um, PVC vinyl fence, decorative um, picket fence. So again, we're raising the grades. We're going to have to lift that up and reset it. The, the one other question I had is on the diagram that we got. On the diagram we got, um, uh, it's on the one that's online. I don't know why it's not in the document we have. Um, there's a drain. Is it what? What drainage is already in the middle of the field now, and what drainage are you putting in the middle? Of the field? Sure. Um, on this plan, hey, let me actually go back a couple of pages. Actually, I'll do it right here because I'm a little technologically challenged tonight. <laughs> there is a main trunk line. Believe it or not, the land pitches from south to north towards Charles Street. However, at Charles Street, there's a low point at the very top. You can see the little round circle um, right in the center. If you take um, the pitcher's mound and go right up to Charles, you see a little circle. That's a low point in Charles. From there, the water actually bucks grade, and there's a trunk line that runs down the center of the field. It's tied into the system, comes over here, and then ties into a system that goes off the property. So what we're proposing, the drainage be, so there's right now, as part of this estimate, there's no under drainage to the field, like for a high-end engineered athletic field, that you have every 15, 25 feet, there is not that. It's an elementary level. It's not really necessary. Um, but what we do have, again, is just a surface drain along the top, um, along the edge of the pavement to protect it. And then because we're raising up here, we're creating a low spot here. So that dot right there, that dot right there is an area drain. And then to avoid the minefield of geothermal wells, we're tying back into that main truck line underneath the um, skinned in field. Because the skinned so in field so there's, is... There's no drain, there'd be no open drain of any kind in the middle of that field. Correct. Or anywhere in that field. Correct. Everything is buried to within um, a foot of the surface. So you could look, if you need to access it, you, need to, you could dig it up, but not so close to the surface that you're gonna see brown dried out rings in your field. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did, um, have you already tested what is in that crap fill that's on top of the geothermal wells. We've done it from a an, a civil engineering point mm -hmm. standpoint of drainage and depth to ledge and things like that, but environmental has not been completed yet. Dr. Francis. <laughs> that was new stuff put in with the recent construction, right? So our suspicion would be low. Yeah. Our yeah. yeah. right. suspicion is low yeah. for that. It just it was on this estimate in big bold letters at the bottom. Yeah. Um, based on the history on several of the school sites in town, just had to throw that caveat on there. To give you to give everybody a, a frame of reference, this field, the whole entire grass area is about 1.6 acres. A full size soccer field is around in between two two and a half acres. So it's about 60% of a full-size soccer field. You say grass. There's not a lot of grass there, except growing in the infield, as I said the other day. Um, 
fifteen percent contingency. Are we comfortable that that's the right number? Um, we've looked at it a few times. You know, contingency. That's always a, a tricky game. Um, fifteen percent is I'm pretty comfortable with that at this point. Except the caveat down below of if there's impacted soils. Yeah. Right. That gets blown out of the water. That. Our set. Dr. Francis. In our prior conversations, there had been sort of the discussion of how long the field will be out of use and grass versus sod. Is there, do you guys have a time frame in terms of this, and, and what's the expectation vis-a-vis -vis those two issues? If you would like rapid use of the field and not get it offline, um, sod would be the way to go. You could use it within three to four weeks, but your cost goes up. Um, this is not sod. This is not sod. So, so what's the time frame expected to be? Uh, with, um, so ideally you need two full seasons of growth, but in, that's if you're playing on it every day for heavy sport, sporting events. And these are young children, they're, they're not massive people, you know, they don't leave huge footprints. So um, if we get a full season out of it, a full um, half of a growing season by the time you essentially would want to plant in the fall, yeah. let it do its thing, um, and maybe half of the spring hold off on it if it's wet or um, if it needs to be infilled or anything. And then when it starts getting nice, I'll let the kids have at it. So this is a question probably more for Dan and Lori. I think we've missed the call for the June RTM meeting. So if we did get to the BET, the thought is we wouldn't get construction money uh, through an interim until the fall, and then what's the thinking to do the work then, or to wait for the following summer? Next summer. Um, so the thinking is that we would um, get a sense for whether this would move forward once it gets presented to BET, and over the summer we would do the design work. We do need several months to do that and get ready, you know, for bidding, etc. And then at that point, look to start the work as soon as possible. I mean, we were trying to get this done even in the winter. I mean, you can certainly work on fields depending on weather conditions. Um, yeah. I mean, our time our time is more related to how quickly we can get to the uh, through the BTRTM process. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have added that with the uh, with the design work that we would be doing over the summer, it would. Um, prepare us for a more refined cost estimate in September, which is when we would plan to go to the RTM. Mr. Chair. I want to reiterate what you just said, because it's bid for seed, for seed not sod. You have to plant in the fall, leave it alone in the winter, and part of the spring. So this is not a summer project, right? It could be. Okay, how would you make it a summer project? You put it out to bid in the winter. Yeah. You line your contractor up for the spring, yeah. construct over the summer, plant in the fall, and you would have to isolate the field until the following spring. But that's my point. Right. Any way you slice it, you have to have this isolation of the field. And let see from is that right or is there another option? Yeah, no, it that is hundred percent right. You're losing the field for a season, yeah. So if you um, part of this equation on the estimate we have here, the opinion of cost, we have a, a, a sum for irrigation on the field. So in, it is highly recommended to have irrigation, especially at an elementary school with your restrictions on pesticides and herbicides. Um, otherwise, you're in, on an uphill battle. Right, but look at the condition of some of our other elementary school fields. Maybe we need to make that our standard going forward. We fix our properties. And we should have a discussion with Parks and Rec. Yes, we should. A much larger discussion. Ms. Davey. Can we open this in phases because the kids really need the playground? Can we do that and then protect the grass area from use? Because I really don't want to wait as long as you're telling us it'll take. So for the playground and the pay play area and the basketball courts, yeah. have at it. Okay, so yeah. we can get that in the winter coming up. Mm -hmm. 
other questions about this? <laughs> All right, if not, we'll take this up as an action item at our meeting. Thank you. All right. Um, for the next item, actually, Lori, I think I can cover this. Um, so this is the new Lebanon Building Committee. Uh, this is what we call FF&E. This is furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So basically, we're talking about furniture and IT infrastructure. Um, the uh, the committee, actually, it's clear who's here, um, but the committee and the professionals can be here on the 14th if needed, and we can talk about that. And if there are questions that come out of tonight, uh, you can let me know if we have the right people lined up. Um, overall, again, projects on time and on budget. Uh, we do love our guy who's filing with the state, um, so we're thrilled to hear you using elsewhere. Um, we actually are projecting to have our temporary uh, occupancy to be at December 24th of this year. Wow. I mean, we are moving, they're cooking, uh, and it's, it's relatively amazing. So the, the, the information before you tonight relates to furniture, fixtures, um, equipment, and IT plans. Uh, they are generally consistent with the ed spec. Uh, the adjustments are to add casters on chairs um, and touchscreen uh, instead of projector type smart boards, which are the district standards. Um, all of this work was done in conjunction with KGND being involved, um, Lori and Dan have been great, uh, Phil has been involved, and basically the idea is to make sure that everything we're doing in this building conforms to what we want our buildings to look like into the future. So uh, Russ, has been, uh, Russ has been kind with his time um, and, uh, and has worked with the committee. Um, the IT portion of this, and one of the reasons why I just want to highlight this, is actually a draft only. Um, we're actually voting on it. I think it's next Wednesday. Uh, it's been vetted, vetted by Phil and his team, um, but we needed time to actually vote on it. So by the time we meet on the 14th, that will have been approved by the committee. Um, what happens after that is basically we will vote. The committee will put this out to bid. Um, it doesn't actually obligate us to, to purchase this. In fact, some of these are what we're going to call adults. They're nice to have, depending on how the money comes back. We have a, a set of money allocated for this. And depending on how it comes back, we may look at it and say, well, that's a nice to have, but we're not going to have it now because it's not within our budget. So uh, it's optionality. It's not actually uh, based on anything else. And basically, it will come down to need and budget, right? We need a certain number of things in each room, but then there's the rest that we're trying to, to do in line with, with where we're trying to go. So uh, that's it. Uh, if we were to buy everything on here at you know market prices without being up for competitive bidding, my guess is we'd probably be somewhere over budget. So that's why this is going out as it is a, uh, an add-all. Ultimately what happens um, is we will, once we vote on it, we actually submit to the state because we do get reimbursement for this. A form will go in, the superintendent signs it, I sign it, the building committee signs it, uh, and I think the architect has already signed it, ready to, it's ready to go, just to keep our process moving. And basically what we do to, to go out to bid now is so that when we do get our certificate, we're ready to fill that building, we're ready to move kids. Um, and this also is done in line with looking at what we already have in our building, what we can bring over, so it's not buying every single last thing that we need. It's what do we already have that we can repurpose, um, so hopefully we don't end up with, you know, gobs of extra stuff in the building. That's, that's not the idea here. Miss um, Gaten. I love the beautiful photographs. Only one thing really caught my eye, and it's only because of the way it's expressed. I'd love to know more about this item because the eligible cost seems very high to me just looking at the range. It's called admin side chairs for $58,000. Um, in my mind, I'd like to put more resources into the learning spaces and less into the admin side chairs. So can you explain that item? That's the name of the item. It's actually, we're not buying, you know, $20,000 chairs from each of the admin. I think that those are the teacher chairs. I think they also go into the media center. But we can get that information for you. It's, it's not the three chairs in the office. Yeah. So I think, I think it's just the name of the <laughs> item. But thank you for asking. We will, uh, Claire's got that. Claire's got that noted. We'll, we'll find out that for the 14th. Yeah, so, so some of the names are really, really funny. Um, the kidney-shaped tables have different names. They, they've got these little stair things. Um, but if you have questions about particular items, please do look at that before the 14th, if you can let us know in advance. We just want to make sure we have the right people at the meeting to answer the questions, or we can get the answers to the board before that meeting. Dr. Francis. 
I hate to be picky, but when I was looking back at the Ed Specs, what we have, it says draft for review. Not that I want anybody to go on a major search, but do we have the actual approved Ed Specs? They're somewhere on the website. Okay. Can you maybe take that on? I think they're on the building committee website, okay. actually, as opposed to like just posted on the board uh, docs. Okay, just because. So it's if a you little... go to the district website right. and then under priorities, it's New Lebanon. But, but Kim will double check. Yeah, because we have the link from our report going to draft for review, so it, yeah, it's no, not yeah, linking to the Ed Specs. We're, we're finalized and voted on by our board, so there's a final version of those. Ms. Raymond. Um, so in the alternate alternates, um, in the alt row, it looks like ninety-five thousand dollars. And then if you subtract or deduct the alternates at sixty-five thousand, so what's still in alternates is that the is that the um, star that it's still the caster chairs, dry erase height adjustable, like what's in what's out. Uh, so ultimately, we won't decide what's in what's out until we get pricing back, right? So this is just to say these are items we're looking at. They're not actually required by the Ed Specs. There are things that would be included if we could. And sometimes what it is is a replacement for something else. You may see, you can see two kinds of chairs on there, and depending on how the pricing comes in, we might take one over the other. We suggest that the giving model. Right. We need to do this for the state, Mr. Chair. Sure. Yeah, the only reason this comes to the board is because the state's requiring an approval. But I'm really confused about approving something that might change. So why is this before us now if it doesn't have a specific... We, we actually have to submit this to the state in order to put the bid out. So it's, why, it's kind why, of a chicken... Why, why, why is that? If you could explain 90% of the things the state does, I'd be thrilled to hear it. Um, because they want to know what you generally think are going to be the cost of furnishing the building, but they also understand that there's an alt process, right? You're, you're going out to bid. This will be competitively bid. When we look at this, right, we can say, okay, this manufacturer, hey, these are Herman Miller chairs. Somebody might have a cheaper version of a Herman Miller chair. So we need to go and we need to look and see what's going to be best for the building. Again, the focus is on what do we absolutely need for the classroom, and then if things come in low, what else we might we be able to do? We don't want to be buying furniture for this building five years from now. We're trying to future-proof. Any other questions? If not, uh, happy to take them by email um, and bring them to the building committee. Uh, if there is an interest in having professionals here, if you could let me know a couple days before the board meeting, um, certainly we can have Steve Walco come, but if we need the architect or the uh, or the furniture expert uh, will probably be here at the next meeting, so if there are questions about the IT. It's I would just, like to just vote for us not doing that. Yes. You would like not to uh, not to have it? All right. Well, if somebody has a, a need, please do let me know. Otherwise, uh, we'll just see if we can get Chairman Walpo uh, here just to just answer any questions. All right. With that, we move on to budget limitations. Thank you, Dan. I just had a quick question about the, um, the agenda. We have the interim appropriation under action items. Yep, we can take that when we get to action items. Okay. Let's, yeah, we'll work okay. through our discussion. We'll come back to that. All right, so we're on budget limitations. Um, before we start, I know that we at our last public meeting voted in the sense of the meeting to add a special ed uh, special ed evaluation as mm -hmm. part of the budget item. I didn't see that in here. I did send it up by email. Okay. We did. We voted as a sense of the meeting. You were out of the room. I didn't vote for it. Well, we can check the minutes, but uh, we did vote on that to, to put money into the budget, the uh, the next year budget for a special education monitoring report. Not a monitoring report, but an outside evaluation. Go ahead, Lord. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, as you know, the district has made a decision to uh, redesign the budget. Um, and so I'm taking this opportunity to sort of uh, look at our existing processes and um, what we plan to do with the redesign. And I'm trying to align them. And then, of course, where there's, you know, duplicative items, trying to try to streamline those. Um, so... 
this is also the time of year where I understand um, the guidelines, the budget guidelines that the Board of Ed uh, typically reviews each year, um, so is reviewed in, in June. Uh, so it's at this work, work session where we discuss it, um, and then it's adopted in, in June or approved in June so that we can begin our budgeting process um, over the summer. Um, and so what I've done with the guidelines, I mean, they, they look pretty similar to what, I mean, I didn't make any major changes to the guidelines from what you've seen in the past. Um, but what I have done is I tried to, like I said, eliminate any areas where I thought they would be otherwise covered uh, through the budget redesign, um, or perhaps they were um, duplicative and appear, you know, appeared in another in another process um, or practice. Um, and I did provide the red line version so you can see all of the edits. So we're voting on this yeah. yeah. So this gets voted on June fourteenth, um, and so sort of in line with this recommendation, what I would like to do is take these guidelines, rename them, and just clarify that this is the Board of Ed policy and procedure, um, and then include that in our uh, new budget book um, as such. I think it will provide a lot of clarity to, um, to the end user, to our stakeholders, um, you know, versus seeing the phrase sort of multiple guidelines in, in our budget book. I, to me, being fairly new, it just seems to be a little bit clearer, and that's what we're trying, we're looking for. <laughs> right, that's another word. <laughs> so I support that philosophy of not having three sets of guidelines. Let me see, three sets. Well, let's see. We have the BET. We have some years the BOC. You don't want the BOE. So I think it's a great idea to incorporate it into procedures. That's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're still going to see this annually, right? Because right. we may need to make modifications. But I think the idea is to incorporate it as part also of the budget book itself so that anybody looking at our budget sees what our driving factors were in the creation of the budget. Right, and I want to add that when I reviewed, so I did a lessons learned um, going through this budget cycle for the first time, and what I observed is that everything that the that you outline as a guideline is what we do. Um, so it really is our practice. And in fact, I went back through the minutes and I looked through the history on board docs, and it's been in existence for as far back as I could go. So um, to me, this is this is really our procedure. This is what we do. Um, so I just thought it should be uh, stated that way um, in the budget book. Dr. Francis. So the only thing, well, not the only, but the thing that I was thinking about when I first read this and kind of didn't get back to is we're going to the CAVE model in terms of policies. Um, and so I'm wondering if it might not be a bad idea to crosswalk to the policy in CAVE and either I don't know, number it that way since that's where we're heading or look at that one and compare it or how do we want to kind of address that from a policy perspective? Yes, um, Mrs. O'Donnell has already asked me about the uh, K budget policies and I sent her copies of them. So yeah, we, all we have to do is look at this a little bit more, maybe look at the K policy and then just find a number for it. But she's already done her due diligence. Right, and so what we may uh, end up doing is having to, because this gets approved, I presume in June, then um, if we do need to renumber it or just make modifications to this policy excerpt, then we would present it as a revision in, in September, and I would expect that to be fairly um, simple and straightforward. Um, we might also be able to look at this on June 7th at our meeting. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. You get a breather. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, can I ask one more question? Oh, there's one more question. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, getting the cobwebs out of my head, but this isn't this the point where we also tried to change the number on the dollar amount that needs to go to other people for approval? I don't see any of that in here. Is that something we want to consider again? That's the budget resolution document. So that's different from this. It is. And we'll still have a separate <coughs> budget because we're talking about compressing everything into kind of one. 
but we're going to have a separate budget. No, we don't do that. that. We don't do that now. We would do that when we when we move towards the budget process in the fall. And basically, our, our role is to make suggestions as to the budget resolution uh, document. And obviously, we can take a vote of the board, but uh, it's got to go up the food chain, so to speak. Well, hang on, because the board already did vote on budget resolutions. We absolutely did. That's recorded as a vote. Yeah. That's our intention. So it it's a coordination. It, yes, but it was disregarded by the finance board this time. So we need better coordination between our board and them after we take a vote to express our intent and to find out if it's not happening, why? Mr. Chair, sure. yeah, that's not us. I was going to say, it's not this. The purpose of this thing, Lord, just the history of this thing, was for the board to express when you go build a budget what we do and don't want it to be certain to cover. That's the purpose of this document. So it's, it's, it's a totally internal process thing, so that before the budget process starts, the administration knows, that, hey, board, if you've got something on your mind or something you want in that budget, mm -hmm. or, by the way, don't put it in here. On your point on the budget resolution, I, I think Peter's correct. Our budget resolution, we don't have a budget resolution. Our budget resolution is input to someone else's budget resolution. There is no legal standing of ours on its, on its own, ultimately, in the budget. So we can send forward suggestions. I think the finance board I can't speak for everybody. I know at least I know at least six members over there understood exactly what we sent over, and they just didn't agree, which is their prerogative, right? So I I, I don't think it was one where they. I have no issue with them disagreeing. Yeah. My issue is I need to understand mm -hmm. the reasoning behind a decision taken by another board. So oh, we know how our approvals are going to work and why they're going to work that way. We can adjust. Yeah, you, I, I think you're on that committee. Maybe you can ask them to come back and tell us. It's reasonable. All right. With that, we'll uh, we'll take these up at the June 14th meeting. If anybody has any input, please email uh, the superintendent and uh, look for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next up is the report schedule. So Dr. Gilday. And I guess while she's pulling that out, I'll note this relates to the fact that we've changed the way we structure our meetings next year um, so that the work sessions go away. We've got some retreat scheduled, some budget meetings, so it's a, uh, a bit of a, a different look for us. And welcome. Great, Henry. So, a couple things to change. I won't have my feelings hurt. Um, Henry's going to be here next All right, so this is simply a draft based on the board calendar was actually already approved. So the, um, the actual, the three columns to the left you already saw and approved in November, something like that really early. Um, so those are done. And now I just added the report um, schedule or topics for you for your consideration. Again, I've already found some things that probably will want to adjust it as a draft. But then if there are other things that are your priorities or your topics, this is the time to share some of those and we will get those scheduled in. So it's almost like a mini agenda plan for you to see and uh, respond to. The thing that I thought we would change already, I accidentally put your um, written reports for humanities and math into January, which is a retreat, which won't work. So that needs to move um, to a different time. I found something else to change too. Miss O'Neill. I think I, I read that the um, Lighthouse training starts in February. December. December and January. December, 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 February, April. There's, there's no way of moving that up or it's not practical. Of course there is. Sure there is. We were just trying to work within your schedule. But yeah, we can ask um, Nick Caruso from CAVE for a diff additional dates if you'd rather do that earlier or different days. Totally up to you. You've been kicking, off, kicking that off earlier. Do you have suggestions on dates you'd like to do that? Your fall's busy. 
Your fall is busy. Yeah, your fall is really busy because that's really, in the fall you do on this um, structure, I think your energy is, of course, on the annual goals, making sure, um, especially if you have a new team, right, you want your annual goals, you want your uh, progress on your last year's achievement data, your achievement reports, then you, you know what I mean, you kind of want to get on the, the cycle and the pattern of that activity early. Uh, but then you want to do, you do want to focus. And then all of a sudden we get into budget, right? We get into budget, you get your budget hearings. Um, so we're kind of even sneaking into the budget cycle a little bit, which I was slightly nervous about, but but you could always do a different day. I think Dr. Francis. So I don't have a clear sense of exactly what we're going to be doing with the Lighthouse Project as much as I'm very much looking forward to doing it. It's obviously somewhat theoretical, but I almost feel like it would help us in terms of formulating our annual goals evaluating those things so I'm wondering uh, first meeting I mean because our first meeting doesn't seem like there's anything in that meeting that's so critical that it be the first meeting right that day is your first day of school or right around right around um, maybe it's good for the board to get a school too maybe so, so okay. what's the possibility of having that first session be a a separate day from a board meeting so that we could have an intense three or four hours uh, and get it going and I agree with Dr. Francis that it should help us in the rest of our processes and developing goals and stuff so I would I would look at that and I, I would have it in a venue separate from the boardroom so it should stand aside separate and, and be special and be focused and not be just another meeting. I think any other time I would agree with you, but we're going to be a very um, busy crew uh, this summer, so I would not want to add another meeting before August 30th to do that. Yeah, I don't. Mr. Chair, this needs to be redone. We're not thinking this through properly. January and February now? No. That's all going to be. Uh, hiring a new superintendent. So we're not, we, we've got to think through, you, someone's got to go back and give them current events and go back and look at this schedule because otherwise, and you know, maybe other people are like, well, I, I can't go to seven, eight, ten meetings a month uh, just because we have these committees and all the rest of it all stacked up. I can't fit that into my calendar. I can do, right? You know, two board meetings, and I could do some committee meetings, but the idea of meeting, you know, eight, ten times because we're stacking all this stuff on top of each other, I'm not going to be able to do that. Maybe I'm the only one. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. We tried to build it into your board calendar for that reason. Right. Yeah, I think it looks good. Dr. Francis. Was there a consideration for the August 30th? I mean, I know it says business meeting. I don't know how strict we are as far as what we can put into those different meetings. Well, we, we, we certainly could add a, a discussion item to that meeting and, and have maybe Nick come and, and kick off and explain the process and we can have a discussion around it. What's the expectations? The start Lighthouse if we're not actually going to do it? That's the thing I'm worried I, If we're going to get into it, it's an integrated process. you got to get into it and do it. This idea that we're going to be kind of breaking it up because that's what our calendar looks like. I, that's not the kind of investment I want to make. We're going to do it. Let's do the program. I'm for doing the program. The timing is what it is, I think. I, again, I don't know that I know enough about it, but is there some sense that you need to do it in some time frame? Yes. Like, yes. It's like, it's like, it's no, like I understand that, but I mean, like, is it... You're is it like a procedure content. that you have to do every four weeks, or can it be one time it's two months apart, the next time it's a month apart, and then it, the, the timing, I mean, I understand that you kind of want to get things flowing, but on the other hand, I'm not sure I want to give it up because we feel like there's going to be some bumps in the schedule. I, I don't want to give it up. I just didn't want to do something in advance of August 30th. Yeah. 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 Is there any way that you would maybe, because I don't understand the modules, but I mean, could you do it like an hour before every meeting or something like that? No? Okay. No, if you remember uh, the man that did the, I think, 
you both came, right? So the man that did that workshop, so it's that kind of style. So, you know, you're sitting, you're seeing some um, training materials. He'll give you some of the same things we went uh, over on those eight main questions and how to look at data, good data questions to ask. There will be a section on goal setting. The board will have to decide if you want to have cabinet in that or if you just want to have it uh, be board, uh, districts do it either way. Um, so you will have to make that determination. Just a, a note, the December 6th uh, session is swearing in of new BOE members. That's wishful thinking. Uh, there's no election this year. As much as we all want another election. Yeah, not this year. <laughs> Um, I guess maybe, I know PGC is meeting on the 7th, and you know, maybe that's a good opportunity to, to talk this through with, with Dr. Gilday, um, because you've already got that baked in the schedule, Dr. Francis. So if you say any people want to give us maybe input, and if there's anything you want. <laughs> yeah, they really do want input, so. All right, so uh, so we'll we'll see this again on the 14th, possibly with some revisions, and if you just keep us posted on that. All right, anything else on that one? No. All right, moving on. Uh, the 5,000 series of policies and a couple of filters from the sixes. I'll send you off. So again, this is the um, process. This is the first read of these policies. Um, we've gone through almost all 6,000 and a few of them uh, left out to get further information. And so now we have the 5,000 series. We have their K policy, so they can cross off K with the legal, um, latest legal decisions. Uh, we then cross off them with our own policies. We also sent them to various administrators to check out, to make sure that uh, these were actually the very latest uh, procedures and policies and what they were doing and that we were compliant and so on, and various little wordings that might have to change as to who's in charge of, of what. Um, so they're pretty straightforward. We got some questions, and I'm always grateful um, for the questions, and we got those two, those clarified about uh, students from uh, Unified districts, whether they uh, they get placed in any district in the in the uh, state based on on state law. So, um, but anyway, um, didn't get a lot of questions. I hope that they are clear. They're certainly clearer than what we have right now, and I think it's really fortuitous that we have been doing this uh, K policy change because the policy book is a guideline for any superintendent. And now we really have a lot of momentum because uh, Kathleen and, and again have been working very hard. We meet every every other week for two hours and we just plow away and then we do our homework. Uh, so this is a real benefit to the board and it's a real benefit to the administration that the policies be very clear and very precise. Um, so that's what you're looking at. That the, and the complete 5,000 series, the end of that, and a few of the 6,000 series. So, Ms. O'Neill, I, I had sent you an email, and I know I need to do my homework. Um, I did note some of them had some alternative language, so I guess the committee, uh, and I'll send you an email with the numbers. I just mm -hmm. pulled one up right now, so did you, just so you can yeah. go through yeah. and make sure that those are clean. And then I, I noted expulsions here a couple of times, and I got your email back, but it, it shows up in a couple of different areas, so I'll just double check that. Yeah, I think that's right. Any other questions on these? Ms. Olson. Yeah. Um, so these are a culmination of, of CAVE and our policies. Is there a way, because it's, it's confusing to me to see what came from CAVE and what we added in. Is there a way to highlight or bold or flatline or no, something? We've, we've gone through that. And so what you see is 99.8% CAVE. Right. And on the bottom, I mostly put the link to, and a lot of the policies, I put the link to our current policy. Okay. Our current policies cover five and six topics in one policy. <laughs> I mean, if you looked at um, student wellness, oh, it just covers soup to nuts. And so you, you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So that's why I tried to put the, the uh, when I've done the search, the most, uh, the, the policy that most aligns with the one we're proposing. Right. 
So, no, you can't you can't do a red line version. We've been been through that. Okay. Even bold in there, some sort of no. No. I think that would be really hard. I think that'd be really hard. But you know, you do have access to the Cape policies as a as a Cape member. Right. I have I. Because I do this, I have it right on my favorites. And I can hook right into the Cape Policy Manual so you can see all of those. Um, and, and then, you know, you can, I usually have two computers lined up and then I can see exactly where they are. I want to compare something directly. So I, I just want to ask a process question. I think we were working on trying to get these uploaded to our website in an appreciative manner. Do we have a time frame for when that's all going to come together? Camera. The keeper of the website. How, how we're doing on getting all the policy documents up on the website. The boards and talk to them, but they're not in the All the 9,000 are up. I'm working on processing the 6,000 for the regular process. Awesome. Much appreciated. Ms. Olson. Yes. Um, I don't know if I do, Dr. Bill, they can answer this. Or, um, how much, what's the percentage? I'm looking at, sorry, page. Uh, 164, 6172. Mm -hmm. Gifted and Talented Program. What's the page number? Uh, 164. Uh, we talked a little bit last time about grouping. We had a conversation on grouping, and this uh, this is more specifically one of our programs. Um, so, what is the what's our percentage of students in elementary schools in uh, that advanced learning program? It, it varies it anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Okay, and I I I'm totally on board with the. Um, meeting the needs of our gifted and talented students, but from what I understand, gifted students usually is like two percent. So to me, it seems like it's almost a, it's almost like a school within a school. If you have fifteen to twenty percent of a, a, you have two curriculum, so if one group is then, um, one group is then, basically from what I from what I've seen and noticed and read, um, gifted makes sense because you have a, a two percent who are extremely gifted. It's very rare to actually be gifted. At, um, but I think if we have a advanced learning program and if pulling students up almost sometimes up to 30, 35% of classroom time, you have a school within a school. Um, so I, I'm trying to under, understand if that's, <coughs> what, if that's what we want. Yeah. Look, we've had a policy for gifted education going back to the early 60s. Right. Um, there is a state mandate that you have to identify students, so it seemed logical in the town of Greenwich that we were going to serve these students. It's no point in saying, you've got a child who's achieving above his peers in a particular area, and one of the outstanding features of the Greenwich program is that we do it by discipline. We don't say, you're gifted, so you're pulled out all day. Right. So some kids are only pulled out for reading, some for, for math, some for uh, <coughs> going to this social study science. So it is a program that serves the needs of those kids. Um, you can, most of the literature, you can go into 2%, and that's highly gifted. Mm -hmm. And we have some of those kids who then we have other processes and procedures and, and placements for, the, for those students. But when we look at the data for the, for the town of Greenwich, we look at pretty much 15 to 25% of our kids are significantly above average for, the, for their grade level. Francis. When we had, I think it was two reviews ago, and I was looking to see if Bonnie was still here, um, the, the guideline that she was using from NAGC, from the what is it, National Association for Gifted Children, talked about being in the top 15% compared to your peer group in your school as the, the definition she was using for our program and from NAGC. Ms. Dayton. But you know the percent isn't. But I just wanted to respond to the fact that I think we're off track. The percent of kids that are in the pol in the program is not mentioned anywhere in the policy. So we need to kind of stick to the to what's in the policy. So what is in the policy is a pullout of five hours a week. I don't think anyone could characterize that as a school within a school. Five hours a week is not a school. Where's our Yes, also. Um, I think it. I think it. If it's all three of the um, courses, I think it's usually like thirty or thirty-five percent of the of the of the instructional time they are pulled out. But um, I also just uh, we talked a little bit or came up with something about being more fluid, and I, I'm not. 
I don't see any sort of mechanism for students dropping down. So it's almost like once, once you are in the, the advanced learning program, um, I don't see a benchmark for students to be uh, removed from it without parent consent. I think once you tell a parent your, your child they fit in this program, I think it's, it's, um, they're going to be highly unlikely. So you could have somebody who sort of tests into this program at as young an age as eight or I guess end of second grade, and then um, we talked about, I think with personalized learning, we, we need some sort of fluidity, um, and I'm wondering where's the fluidity um, for students to, to, for something performing well to move into this program, or likewise, um, what's the benchmark? Um, I think without parent consent, you can't really say, I think they're tested every year, but I think they're automatically sort of entitled to stay in this and that's only for them, and we're essentially in a way of tracking, so. Mr. Sharon, how much of this policy is a direct lift from Kate? That's what I asked. Which, I know you did, but in this specific one, how much of this was drafted by the committee, and how, what was drafted by the committee, which is, what of this is a direct lift from Kate? I don't, I don't know, I can't know but what we did do is we took stuff from our current policy, that's the only change that we need to cave was take particular information from our own policy and insert it. And there is the opportunity um, every year for kids to test into the program. There's obviously discussions with parents when kids have to, it, it's not in their best interest to remain in the program. So if that's your concern, yeah, but there is, uh, I mean, you could put a line in there that says, you know, parents will be no because parents are notified, but we can make it very clear that parents are notified if their child is not performing at expected standards or something. Dr. Francis. I would say the answer to your question, Peter, is that if you look through here, pretty much anything that talks about the advanced learning program was cut out of our current policy and put in here. So it was just to give that further definition because, you know, okay, the state doesn't have the requirements for advanced learning programs in every school. The only required um, identification. So what we did primarily is just take the information out of our current policy and put it in here. I don't think there was any creation of new language. It was sort of just putting in the language from our current and adding it. So if it says, if, typically if it says gifted in the top introductory, that comes from the original. And then when you go in, in fact, you can probably see in some places where the, the font changes. When it goes into the description of the ALP program, that comes from our current. Yeah, I guess the reason I'm asking the question is, is that, I mean, our, 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 princip our, our stated principle with this was to have policy, follow one that's, it used to be called policy and procedure, now it's called policy and regulations. It's the exact same concept as policy and governance that was here. And I worry about the ones where we go through these policies and we aren't staying true to our principle I'm using this as an opportunity to uh, not get overly prescriptive on top of the superintendent about it, it, how this is to be executed. This one feels to me, there's a lot of text here. And it just, it, as a policy, it just feels super prescriptive to the superintendent. Maybe we want it this way because you know, to be candid, there are some educators who are not in love with this whole idea, and they exist inside the district, so let's call a spade a spade. If we, let's just say, take off the, take off the prescription, and maybe people just go, hey, I got a clear shot to just go rip it out of here, because I never liked it anyway. But I, I just, I'm trying to understand what it is, what we had, and what's here. You know, I can't, this is crazy. I mean, to look at policies and vote on them three meetings of 165 pages, so you got to pick your spots. So I'll, I'll pick I this mean, one. I mean, we can come back to you. I can send out an email during the weekend and explain what we what. Well, I'd like to get more detail about this one. Right. I mean, I can that that'd, that'd be great. We'll yeah. show you with Cade and then what we took from our own policy. Right. Okay. All right. And for me, I don't know what anybody else has. Anybody have anything else on the policies? Yeah. Miss um, Wilson. Um, I had this, this is more of a, again, I guess that's sort of a philosophical question, but I was looking at policy, um, page 
time to use it. Um, I'm going to number 5114. It's suspension and expulsion. Um, it's, it's somewhere in there. Um, it's, it's, it's within the suspension. Like I said, it's, it's more general. I think as we are, as we're looking at social emotional learning, as we're incorporating PBIS, I was surprised to find that we're, we are, we're doing the most sort of severe punitive consequence of, um, <coughs> of in-school suspension as early as, I think as early as we can, which is third grade. Um, and I was, I'm, I'm taken aback by the, I guess the, uh, I don't know, inconsistency between our support of what our school is uh, trying to promote in terms of positive um, behavior enforcement and all of that, and then also this punitive approach. And I've done a lot of research over the years on this, and I found that um, there's a lot of, uh, and I can show up you guys at some point if anyone's interested, but there's a lot of uh, research, um, Department of Education is warning against suspending it too early to make because it's actually more harmful, not only to that student, but to the students around the class, also the, tends to be more, um, Disadvantageous for minority students. It, it, it actually can lead to an achievement achievement gap later. So, so there's this a lot is of reasons. A suspend. I, I, some of the. I, we don't have to go into specifics now, but I just wanted to throw it out there that um, some of our suspension um, policies at the younger ages are on the more punitive side when we're also in, incorporating PBIS at this point and we're trying to incorporate the social emotional learning and what's best for the right. students. And there's a great deal of that in, in the policy. But right. this is the legal. This is something that the state says we have to have as a policy, and this prescribes when, and, and if you, you don't get the privilege of being on the expulsion committee, but we don't use it. We don't use it very often, but you have to have it for the protection of the student and the protection of other students and their right to learn. So this is basically legal. I don't think we put it another word in this. This came right out of uh, the state statutes. So. It's not that we use it, and I know Mary's here, we do lots of stuff on social emotional learning, so we're not going around suspending kids or expelling kids, uh, you know, willy-nilly. It's, it's there because it's the law. Is this something I want to uh, throw out there in the room, especially if you've done All right. Anything else on that? Yeah. Yes, Olsen. It's a lot of policies, 169 days. Yeah, it's home with the six kids. So I, I, I should have read it at 4 a.m. when I was giving a few months in. Um, literally, it's 105. Um, so I, um, again, I, going back, um, and it's helpful about your goodness back, and I, I welcome her to jump in too. But going back to the, to the, the previous policy we were talking about, I'm sorry for jumping back, um, in terms of the, uh, gifted programs. Um, we mentioned earlier that a lot of the a lot of the grades, a lot of the high school programs are open enrollment. So I know I said this once before, but um, I'm finding it counterintuitive to have open enrollment for AP and honors honors classes at the high school. Yet at a younger age, when students are the most vulnerable and learning and um, and hungry for it, to say this is there's a cap on this, like. Um, we're, we're actually, I think, depriving students and affecting them in a way. Um, I've said before, Kel Dweck's growth versus fixed mindset, but I think that's something we need to think about as a board. Okay, right. Anything else? All right, so, so uh, are you trying next to next time. <laughs> we're, we're not voting tonight. No, I get that part. Are this is where we have our discussion. That's a work session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah no, so I, I, so it's four. I'm going to ask a different question. Good. Are we trying to vote on this at the next meeting? Yes, and in the meantime, PGC meets on the 7th, so if you have comments, and these were sent to you in advance of the meeting, if you have comments, you can send them to PGC, and they can answer them uh, at the area the next meeting. And if there are policies that you still have challenges with, right, we can remove them and, uh, and push them forward. It, it was dense. It was the holiday weekend. It was an active agenda today in terms of materials for review and all fairness. The, the thing is, as I pointed out before, you still have another whole week you have all week yeah, to no, email and point. whatever i try to get them out as yeah. fast as i could barbara i just I've, I've said this before I, i'm going to be where the word is you know this meeting this meeting has 10 to 12 items on it we've gone back to these chock-a-block agendas i don't know how we got back there 
So this doesn't live in isolation. And this is pretty big and major. But all of you who were sitting on policy governance and marinating in this, it's all super familiar to you, to the rest of us. It, 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 it's, it, it's not. So I, you know, this is <coughs> like, hey, you can, you know, you can just go back and catch it later is, you know, I think we need to be thoughtful about that. What? Go ahead, say it. But we can't live between two sets of policies. So we need to continue to move forward. And you can change them. There's nothing that says you can't bring up a policy that, and we go back and look at it. But to sit and have the policies that we have now that are, that are all over the place, for which we are missing tremendous amount of procedures, they're not anywhere codified, we're moving in a direction where we actually know and we can have a conversation about our policies because they're more pointed and they're clearer and the regulations will be clearer. So, you know, it, there, there is no easy solution to this. Ms. Olson. So, if, just for clarification, if we were going to go back, because I'm sure there's something that um, I'm interested in that I could end up missing, and if, if we were going to go back and want to bring up a policy, something we could just put on the agenda, so something we have to make a motion and enough people could... Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember about yeah. the weighted talking about weighted average, so we'll come back to that. And I, I just, I'm curious, like, what's the process? Like, can I just say, let's, like, do we have to have enough people want to talk about that policy? So yeah. this is our chance, in a way. Well, that's right. Okay. Well, or, or, or there's al always an alternative, which is you could just ask PGC to take it up, okay. right? And okay. then they can come okay. to the board. I just need to know that. That would be great. I don't right. understand that. that would be there's two ways, right? We can add it to the... We can add it to an agenda, but PGC is also there to assist with the policies. Mm -hmm. And once they do get through these, I'm hoping it's an easier ride for PGC because I'll tell you, I've been on it. It's a lot of work. What they're doing now, I helped with the first set. It, it's a ton of work before you ever see these. So I, I hope you all appreciate what these three are doing. I do. I do. All right. It doesn't seem like it's got a lot of questions, but I do. No, it's all right. Anyway, it's good to ask the questions. We'd rather get it right. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll move on to the next item, which is the DOE self-evaluation. Um, mm. I want to thank all eight members for filling this out. I think uh, this is, what, my fifth year on the board. I don't think we've ever really done it in a comprehensive way. In fact, our numbers actually reflect that. So if you open it up, you'll see our lowest score is on self-evaluation. And I think it reflects the fact that we've never managed to do it. Uh, thank you to Jennifer for uh, chasing down the CAVE model. Um, I do want to point out, Carol, if you haven't read this document, I want to point out that uh, we scored highest basically in the vision, uh, and number five uh, was a 4.8 out of five. Um, the board expresses in the vision mission the belief that high quality instruction in every classroom is the foundation for high achievement for all students. Uh, that speaks of our teachers. So I, I hope you'll relay that to your membership. Um, you know, there were some challenge areas, let's, uh, let's be honest about it. I think we, we have a little uh, work to do in, uh, according to the numbers and community leadership, um, you know, and other challenges. I, I would hope every board member will, will take a look at this, reflect on it. You know, at some point we can have, a, we're going to have a retreat. We'll be in the fall talking about our goals and we should think about our own goals for the year as we, as we reflect on the numbers. I, and that's that's the value I think of this document, and I would hope that when we do it again next year, we'll see growth in the areas that we, we need to work on. Yeah, I, I hope we don't take that many exams that we have enough data to do that. Um, you know, I, I think the document speaks for itself, and just you know, if you have questions about it, but, uh, but this is where we where we landed, and, and I'm thankful that we've done this. It's been in our policy for years, and, and I think it's a useful exercise at the end of the day. All right, with that, uh, the face and communications monitoring report. Uh, Ms. Eves, if you want to come up and join us. Yeah. Uh, you weren't prepared to, to offer anything, but maybe Ms. O'Neill can just uh, ask okay, you I'm questions. happy to talk about it any time. I just had a question, and I might have missed this. I was just wondering. Uh, what the vehicle is or who's in charge of getting the information out to the public beyond the school, to the RTM Ed Committee, to the ET. So when we have that really great news, so that we can take news and report, and those kinds of things, that they win awards, 
how does that out, get out to the public beyond mm -hmm. the school? Mm -hmm. It's, um, I mean, really the, the best way we have right now, and I have some good news on this front, but the best way we have right now is just sending an email. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm cognizant of sending a bunch of one-off emails to, to people when, you know, we're all, our inboxes are all crazy full. So the idea here, um, and we have a chance um, to really read through this, um, the idea here is to develop um, an opportunity where we're kind of aggregating that content and sending it out to those stakeholder groups on a regular basis, like twice a month, and have it all in one place. Um, and there's a new feature that we have on the website. Um, it's called eNotify. And it's basically, basically like a newsletter template kind of thing. And the great thing about it is we can populate the, the database to which it's sent. But as a community member, you can also just sign up for it to receive it. So we get requests all the time. You know, can we receive notifications of news and information? And we don't really have a mechanism for that in terms of maintaining that database. Mm -hmm. We don't have resources for it, really. Um, you know, with internal and staff, we have an SI, we have a student information system that we draw from. Um, so it's, it's, it'll be a great, we have to promote it, we'll have to market it, but people will be able to sign up to receive these newsletters and the information. And we'll have that sent to BET, Board of Selectmen, RTM, et cetera. But when will that start? Is for this next school year. Um, I'll, I'll just say, I actually have signed up. I get the releases from Stanford. Probably too many, but I, I like seeing what they're up to. Good. Keeping an eye That's on the good. Ms. Dayton. Even if you don't have the resources and you don't have the time, can't you just put links to articles that someone else has written? Mm -hmm. At least it's a summary. Yeah. And, you know, if that's the first step in this, let's get it out. The other thing is, we used to have something called points of pride. Do you mm -hmm. remember that? And that's what that's what that that's what will be in these newsletters. Points of pride. That's exactly the model. That's great. Exactly. All right, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, you know, I think you and Mike did a great job. So thank you for everything you guys do. Um, I think we found. I, 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 I mean, this is a question for the next superintendent. I don't know how this gets solved. I think we found a hole. We found a big gaping hole through start time. And um, if I understand the relationship properly, um, it's kind of like the office here does district-wide communications, mm -hmm. and then you rely on the buildings to essentially have a communications capability and that they then are responsible to communicate things that might wind up being building specific. But I think the challenge, one of the challenges is that I'm not sure that you have the authority to essentially be the manager, director, or traffic cop down to the buildings so that if we say, hey, the head of communications is going to be responsible for a district-wide initiative that affects all the buildings, and it's you own the whole communications program, that you are fully enabled, um, authorized, everybody in the district is clear that, hey, the head of communications is calling the shot here, and you guys are supposed to execute. And so I'm wondering, I didn't see it in management concerns um, in the monitoring report, but it's I think we found in a couple instances there were some, the ability to do a district-wide program, because in the way it's structured, kind of fell down in a couple of places. So my question is, is, is there a recommendation on how to deal with that so that that doesn't happen again, or, and you talked to I guess I'm not exactly yeah. sure about no, what you're, you're referring to. What I ask, I'll specific. give you an example, in SST, in SST, there were a series of constituent bodies. Um, the one that leaps off the page was sports parents. Mm -hmm. So when we okay. went a little haywire, you okay. and I had a conversation about who communicated what to the sports parents. Gotcha. You communicated very clearly to me, hey, Peter, um, I only worry about the stuff at the top. It's the building's job to then realize that that is a constituency and they needed to get communications to them that was specific to their life. Okay, that may be the way you heard it, but um, I guess what I was probably trying to communicate was more, 
especially in that particular instance, and really in any kind of a project or initiative, mm -hmm. um, there's a champion. Right. And that champion is responsible really for making sure that there are identified stakeholders and those stakeholders are communicated with. And right. you know, I'm brought in to consult on that project or to help actually execute part of that communication plan or I'm not even brought in at all sometimes. And it's just you know the responsibility of that administrator who's championing that project or that initiative to make sure that they're getting to the groups that they, they need to get to. Um, and, and you're right in the fact that there are holes in that and that what, what this report does address is the building capacity and setting the expectation for a communication plan and very specifically thinking about it at the outset of a project or initiative so that we don't miss stakeholders like that and we're clear about who is supposed to be communicating what to whom. So you're comfortable that with this now, if this is executed, that problem I just know that example, but I'm sure there mm -hmm. are others mm -hmm. that I don't even know mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, that that is going to be now addressed? And it will have to, yes, it will have to be in concert with working with the superintendent sure. and other administration to ensure that, because I'm not necessarily always aware even of a particular project or initiative that's being started. And so the expectation now is that there is a communication plan. We've initiated these project plans, and part of every project plan is a communication plan. So that expectation has been set. Um, and then, but you know, we do have a lot of work to do to internalize that and, and systematize that and make it so that it's very fluid and natural. And okay. So, if, but if we approve this report, because Jim's leaving, right? Then we're going to have the next super. No, no, this is, yeah. Oh, what, right, but then we can turn to the next group and say, this, this is, is what the board wanted to have happen, so it's not open for debate. Exactly. Right? Okay, good. Okay. Any okay. questions? Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. All right, so that brings us to our action items. So the first action item is the Board of Ed. Uh, it's labeled an interim appropriation. I don't think it's really an interim appropriation. I think we're asking for a release of conditions. Yes. You want to come on down in case anybody has any questions? Maybe you can give us the history of why there's a condition to start with. Uh, sure. Um, OK, so uh, the FY18 capital budget included a um, request for, I'm going to assume it was $650,000 for um, architectural and engineering design for our FY19 capital project. So those are the ones that are beginning uh, July 1. And um, the BET uh, placed a condition on a hundred thousand of that six fifty. So our fund um, that we currently have, the budget is five fifty. They're holding another hundred thousand um, that you know the release provided. I guess we provide the um, documentation of need. Uh, where we are at today um, in that fund is that we are showing we have. A, I think I had here a. $13,000 balance of uh, available funds. And um, what I'm certainly familiar with uh, doing this work is that design doesn't end when the project starts. And so design has to actually continue <laughs> during the project itself. Uh, it's called Construction Administration Services. Um, and that was never detailed in the scope of work for this fund that has historically been presented, um, or project that has been presented as part of the capital plan. So we will look to make that clarification going forward when we uh, request a and &E funds, but what's happening now is we don't have money to actually provide the construction administ administration services for our capital projects that are beginning July 1. Okay, Ms. BET colleagues ask me, what have we spent it on so far, and what do we really hope to spend it on in the next two months? Mm -hmm. Can you give me an actual project breakdown, just the main items? Yeah, so um, Dan, I know I had asked to have that information prepared, at least um, in, you know, in advance of the BET uh, meeting. Um, that is exactly what I had asked him to do. So I don't know that we have it tonight, or if Dan can speak to it. But. Talking about it, you know, exact numbers, but for instance, the locker room 
project with the high school. Um, we, the agreement we have with the architect is through um, construction documents. CA services was never included in that. And we're probably looking at somewhere around forty, fifty thousand dollars in total on that. CA services. I think a little higher. Than that. We have that spread across the board. Construction administration. Um, we have probably 15 projects of various, various sizes that are going to go on this summer. So I know one of the questions you're going to get asked from the BET is, do you need the entire $100,000? <laughs> yes. yes. Oh. And you're going to die down. I didn't imagine you were going to say no to me, but I, I needed to ask the question. And I want you to be prepared to answer with more than yes when you go over there. Which you will be, I know. I have to be honest and add that, um, you know, A&E services are obviously, you know, we put the project out, we put those services out for bid. They're all over the place, right? Um, and the fact that we're trying to develop a, a, a budget for a particular year um, is, is difficult, right? I mean, this is really a, um, yeah, but it varies on whether you have significant projects there or whether they're smaller projects and maybe we don't need those CA services for really small projects. So it just depends on what's actually in that capital plan. Um, so I, honestly coming in, I kind of looked at this project as the A&E fund that is, as, a, um, as to be used on any project. Yeah. The ones that are going on this year, ones that we're trying to plan for next year, maybe even in the future. Um, not specific to a fiscal year, and that's the way the project has been requested. I'm just not clear why. Um, we'll certainly uh, try to clarify that going forward. Mrs. Yes, sure. Um, you have to look at it exactly the way you look at it. It used to be they would attach a and &E to every project. That is impractical. Okay. The other thing they would do is they wouldn't give you the a and &E dollars for that year's projects because they were associated to that project. That doesn't work either because A&E needs to be done in the year of prep. So what they did is they came away and said, what's going to be your total capital request? $10 million? Fine. What's A&E? 15%? Fine. My A&E request is an A&E slush fund for, and it's going to be in the, once you get rolling, it's the prior year, right? So we were always running at $10 million, so it didn't matter because it was always 15% of $10 million, right? So you always had that from the year before, and that's the way you were spending it. I think you want to do it the same, a similar way, unless you can get more precise. But the, the support from the, the BET understands all this. So what they don't like I, I, in my experience with them, is they don't like when we roll around to the end of the year and there's all this leftover A and E. That bug is here. Right? Not this year. I know. He's gone. I know. Not I not know. Sure. So that's why they do this crazy thing of putting in conditions. Right. But if you burn all the dollars, they're never going to ask you another question. Well, I'll tell you, 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 this is you want to make a motion on this one? It's on the screen. And this is a 15% of the 10 million. million. To uh, request an additional. Well, it's a request to release the condition. Release the condition for the additional $100,000 of any. Second from Dr. Francis. All those in favor? That's 8 0. Thank you very much. Excellent. Please Thank go you. ask the BET for our money. <laughs> Thank you. All right, with that, the uh, next item is uh, to authorize the board to act as the superintendent search committee. So I'll move that, uh, that we appoint ourselves as the search committee for uh, the superintendent position. Second. Well, so, so the purpose of, of doing this, we, we, we learned this last time and we confirmed this with our, uh, with our council, our outside council. Uh, is if we are going to do the search, basically, this is the way that you are exempt from FOIA, be able to conduct interviews without posting them, be able to hold meetings of the board for the sole purpose of the <coughs> superintendent search. So that's why we do this. Dr. Francis. Does this cover superintendent and interim? And do we need to specify that? Uh, I don't believe we need to specify it. Uh, according to council, this covers both. Any other questions? All right, with that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? 
Eight zero. Thank you very much. We are now the search committee. Get to work on it. Um, all right. Next up is our agenda plan. I don't know that we've added anything to the June meeting. Only Dr. Francis would like to bother. Yeah. Dr. Francis. I would like us to consider whether it might make sense for us to get a little update on a couple of things. Um, I would like think two two things I'd like to kind of see. I've heard some about project plans. You know, is there sort of an outline that's ready to go that we could look at in terms of things that have been set up for this, you know, related to the strategic plan, other kind of project plans. If there's something like that that's fleshed out, I think that'd be great for us and the public to see kind of what's going on with that. So a summary of those things. Um, and the other is to understand where we are with regards to fall sports, lit fields, and um, get an update of where we are and what the plan is for over the summer to prepare us to get there. Uh, the fields update is part of the SST implementation plan, so you'll see that as part of the June 14th report for that, so that's taken care of. Um, and uh, you saw a glimpse of the uh, project plan in the form of the PowerPoint with the roadmap for the strategic plan. That's, uh, that was a visualization of one of the reports, so we're happy to put up another one so you can kind of see what that looks like. They look very much like, um, if you remember, the uh, June uh, SST implementation plan, uh, but what we add is a goal of the program to the top and you know, the goal of what we're doing and then the communication points, the key messages. But otherwise, Champions it looks like timeline that. or exactly. anything that's in there. Exactly, that's all in there. Would, would you take that as a written report, just because I know we've already got a little bit of There are 96, so I will not be giving you all 96, but there are 96. Maybe, maybe some good okay. Yeah, or maybe a list of what the 96 are, and then, you know, if there's sort of prioritization, what are the higher priority ones, those kinds of things, something like that. And I think a written report is great, and if it turns out there's something we really feel a burning need to discuss, then we can always ask for that. So in keeping with the not creating an extra bit of report, what we may do is uh, link you to the, it's all in Excel, link spreadsheet, oh, basically. Yeah. Whatever's and then the yeah. links just Absolutely. to the reports. Yeah. Um, it's already on the agenda, but um, for the discussion on school with all time, just concept one implementation, implementation plan, and be able to give us um, sort of a detailed, delineated view of, of how that would work with the options and I mean with the, 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 the last period oh, yeah. opportunity block okay. all options. Okay. the opportunity block the expectation um, can you just make sure that that's really fleshed out for us right so that work gets fleshed out throughout but yes that's what we've been working on all right if, oh missed out Sorry. The um, I just would also love to know the projects that we're working on over the summer meaning the capex projects and this, maybe I just can get that from what they're presenting to the VEG but it was what was in the capital plan. Yeah. Right, but so like, uh, just to make sure that... No, I guess that's right. Like the locker room and everything like that, that's all happening. And the work at Central. And all that. I also, because at one point I thought I heard there's something happening at Hamilton Avenue over the summer, separate from we had, what we, we talked about. We had the, about. the firm playground that was in our Yeah, I guess, plan. so it's, so it's everything that's in the capital plan, is nothing that's changed? Nope, it has passed by the B, it's passed by the BT and the RTM. For the summer, I'm sorry, is that the question? Yeah, work for the summer, the summer work. Yeah, no, no, nothing's changed. I mean, the only thing is that we're hoping to be able to do a little bit more with the field improvements for at um, Hamilton have a leveling of it, but other than that, I mean, everything else is as part of the capital plan. Yes, yeah, you. Just <coughs> that I had um, that we're adding the master plan to the June 14th meeting, right. and I think I heard that we're adding the um, library learning co commons pilot. Uh, well, I guess that's up to Ms. Parisi as to whether that's ready for prime time. I thought it was going to be. It, it is all right. So yeah, I mean that could be added as part of the. Uh, well, it would be have to be a, an action item if they want to vote on it at that meeting. I think it should be separate and apart from the ones we heard tonight because we have not heard it before. And anything that we can given us, given to us in advance of the meeting would be helpful. Do you want to say in advance? I don't mean like. All right, with that, uh, anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? Oh, Dr. Francis is our second. All right, all those in favor? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.